All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Cavanaugh, the superintendent of schools, and I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a cold December night. I'm sure that you have lots to do, uh, but this is an important meeting, so I am glad that you are here, townspeople, um, elected officials, our teachers, our administrators. It's, it's really great to see all of you here tonight. We are going to try to keep the talking part of this to about a half hour so that after we give you the information, people will be able to get up and visit a microphone and ask us any questions. You can see that we have our staff from DRA Architectural Firm with us here tonight. So if you have questions that pertain to some of their presentation, you should ask them this evening. You will always have access to me and the slides that I'm presenting. But DRA is here for a limited amount of time, so it would be really fortuitous, I think, if, if the time that we have here tonight is spent sort of with them. If you are one of those people who has a burning question, but you are a little microphone phobic, uh, we do have note cards and pens in the back. You can put your questions down on those note cards. We will take them afterward, and then we can review them. At some point in time, we will get answers back to people, whether that means in an HCAM presentation or if it means a presentation at a school committee meeting. But either way, the information that you need will be given to you. Our school committee is here this evening, um, and they are seeing this presentation really for the very first time, as are you. And I just want to talk a little bit about the presentation before we start. I don't want people in this audience to see this and say, oh look, that's a done deal. It's absolutely not. The school department contracted with DRA, and what we asked them to do was to take a look at our current facilities, the land that is available in Hopkinton, our growing enrollment, and to make recommendations to us about reconfiguring schools so that we can accommodate the growth in front of us. Some of you may know that we have a statement of interest in with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. We always say MSBA, so when you hear those letters, that's who that is. If we are accepted into MSBA, they will help us by reimbursing a portion of any kind of pro building project, and you'll see some samples of that tonight. Um, and as if you've been following, if you had been following the Marathon project, you know that that's um, how we partially funded Marathon as well. So, without a lot of further ado, I will begin. So, what is it that you can expect to learn here tonight at this public hearing? I'm going to show you a little bit of our current enrollment and then our projected enrollment. And if you have questions about the projected enrollment, Dr. Arthur Wagman is here tonight to answer them for you. He is the person um, working with DRA who has put that study together for us. You'll be able to see what our current physical plant needs are. Um, and as you may know, we have some articles on an upcoming special town meeting warrant. You'll also get to see our plan for what's it going to look like in the next 10 years. And this plan can certainly be modified. And then at the end, we have some frequently asked questions and we'll review those if they are not the questions that you yourself have asked. So it's no surprise to anyone in this auditorium right now that our enrollment growth has been extraordinary over the last five years. If you take a look at this slide in front of you, when we did our SIMS report in October of 2015, our student population on the SIMS report was 3,463 students. In 2019, it was 3,862 students. That went up 399 students, roughly 400 kids. We've gone up those 400 students, and yet, other than Marathon being a little bit bigger than Center School was, we really have added no classrooms. And now I want to look at our actual enrollment numbers. These are the real numbers. If you take a look at the kindergarten number where the red arrow is pointing, you can see that in 2009-2010, we had a, an incoming kindergarten class of 198 students. If you follow that red line out all the way to where those kids are today, they are 10th graders in this high school. There are now 291 of them. If you look at kindergarten classes generally, 
You started with 198 in 2009, 2010. Today's kindergarten class was 2000, sorry, 269 students. So we are growing. The data is there. You can see it. One of the things that we would call this kindergarten group, the 198 that grew to be 291, we call that group a cohort, just to give you the appropriate language. So we also have some projected enrollment numbers. This takes you all the way out to 2029-30, to that school year. So roughly 10 years out. And you can see that the estimate for our total pre-K to 12 population would be 4,856 students. It's an awful lot of kids. Now, it's really important that you notice that this is a projection. It is, in fact, based in data but it's a projection. We have no way of knowing that these numbers will come to fruition. We have no way of knowing that they are real until we live through this experience. So as I said earlier, uh, Dr. Arthur Wagman, who's with us tonight, um, he's an educational consultant who does this kind of work. When we use the term demographic analysis, what we are referring to uh, is that process that's used to examine your environmental context of the school district, that context that will, in fact, in impact enrollment. And then we use the term forecasting, which is the projection of future events. In this case, for us, it's student enrollment. So what you saw in the previous slide was forecasting. Just like the weather people, we could be wrong. All right, so how did Dr. Wagman go about this? When we talk about cohort survival, um, it's actually calculated based on the number of kids who move from one grade level to the next. And from that data, what you get is an algorithm. And that algorithm is used to calculate how many kids will be coming into the Hopkinton Public Schools. And what's been happening in past years is we've really been using that sort of algorithm, that cohort survival method, and birth rate data. And that's what we've been using. And so if you've been following the questions about why does NESDEC not quite get it right, it's because they only use a portion of the data available to them. So in addition to cohort survival data and birth rate data, we have also, or I should say Dr. Wagman has, taken a look at new housing developments. He has looked at the in-out migration of home resales, and he has looked at the availability of open land in Hopkinton. Where did all of this data come from? Uh, the data comes to us from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. The birth data were supplied by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Registry of Vital Statistics. Hopkinton Building Department provided the number of housing permits annually from 2000 to 2019. Information relative to new and proposed housing developments and subdivisions were provided by Hopkinton's principal planner. Information relative to Hopkinton's real estate market and relevant market data was gleaned from places like Zillow and from our local real estate brokers. And any other additional information sort of just came from having conversations with people who have firsthand knowledge. So why do we think that we'll be growing so much more in the next 10 years. Um, and these are just sort of salient pieces that I picked from Dr. Wagman's report. Peak birth rates in 2016, uh, 159, 2017, 176, 2018, 147, 2019 is 149 extrapolated. Prior to 2016, birth rates in Hopkinton ranged from 118 to 133, so they are growing. Um, as noted in the 2017 Master Plan for Hopkinton, uh, Hopkinton has developed rental apartments, large condominium complexes, and a whole lot more single-family homes. In 2007 and 2008, in Hopkinton, only 27 building permits were issued in each of those two years, 27. In 2016, 385 building permits were issued. Realtors who work in town and who were interviewed reported that 80% of their clients will tell them they are moving into this town for the public schools. And the overall population of Hopkinton has grown from 14,925 in 2010 to 17,974 in 2018. 
You can also see some of the house valuations. I won't spend a lot of time here, but I think the evidence on this slide points to the fact that people are willing to pay and pay a lot to live in this community. And finally, next year's estimated net gain of students enrolling in the Hopkinton Public Schools, 234 additional students. And again, that's a forecast. So I'll talk a little bit about our current physical plant needs. When I'm talking about this, I am talking about the kids who are sitting here in front of us today. These are not projections, these are the realities. So what we need to do is have some kind of temporary measure that's going to hold us over in the here and now until we can start a plan that's thoughtful um, and based in, in actual data. What we are looking to do is expand our high school. We're hoping to add six classrooms to the high school and that would be brick and mortar. So if you look at what the MSBA says the capacity of this building is, it's 1,080 students based on our square footage here. The estimated enrollment for 2021 would be 1,234 students. So you can see we're significantly over the mark. If we carry that all the way out, to FY 2930, we would be at 1,606 kids. So what would that expansion on this building look like? If you look at the dotted line, you can see the potential buildable zone. Here you can see a floor plan, and there would be those three classrooms built, stacked on top of one another on the main level and the upper level, not the lower level. The lower level would be left open. There you can see it so that the bottom is left open and there are two floors added on. And so we can also talk about the Elmwood School where we would like to put modular classrooms. According to MSBA, the capacity of Elmwood is 520 students. Next year we are projected to have 605 students. By 26, 27, it's 682 students. The same is true for Hopkins. We are looking to put four modular classrooms there. These would be stacked units. According to the MSBA, 560 students is the capacity of Hopkins. Next year, we're projecting 637. And by 29, 30, we're thinking 749 students in grades four and five. What do those stackable units look like? You can see this picture right here. You can see the exterior and the interior of a classroom. And before I hand the mic over to Jim Barrett from DRA, who's gonna talk about some of the future work, um, I will just give you one more reminder that those three projects, the four modulars at Elmwood and Hopkins and the build out at the high school are all on the uh, warrant for special town meeting on Monday evening. That's next Monday, December 9th. So I will hand this over to Jim, and if you have questions now, you can hang on to them for the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, and thank you all for having us here this evening. My name is Jim Barrett. I'm principal with Drummy Rosane Anderson. Uh, we're a educational planning architecture uh, firm. We focus on facilities like those here in your community. Uh, we have a team together. Uh, they all seem very comfortable seeing the narrow passage there of not coming to the microphone, so I'm going to turn and ask them if they would to self-introduce uh, because it takes a group of people to put together this type of study work. Um, good evening. I'm John Tyndall Gibson with DRA. I'm an accredited learning environment planner with uh, professional training and experience in education as a teacher, administrator, and school superintendent. I'm Art Wagman. I'm the principal of uh, Educational Resources Management. Uh, we do demographic planning and evaluations, and I've been working with DRA for a number of years now on a number of their very successful projects. My name is Lee Rich. Uh, I am uh, one of the 
project managers at DRA, and I was one of the uh, architects involved in the uh, Marathon Elementary School. Thank you. Uh, so what I'll share with you, and I'll move through this quickly, uh, recognizing uh, the time frame and the desire to get to your questions. Uh, our process in terms of putting together this type of study effort is one of the acts of collecting, listening, visioning, and then ultimately documentation. And these are the four of those represented. And just to give you a flavor of the activity in each, under collection, uh, being able to come to the community and gather information. So one of the key elements is what Dr. Wagman spoke to, and that has to do with demographic and enrollment projections, and being able to come to understand uh, what is happening in the community today, but also being able to project that forward to come to understand anticipated enrollments for the school system. Uh, Dr. Wagman was able to uh, create a report, and that was uh, some of which uh, Dr. Kavanaugh uh, was referencing. Ultimately, uh, the report speaks to, uh, at the 10-year horizon, uh, just over uh, 4,800 students uh, within the system. Another act of collecting uh, has to do with facilities assessment. And what you see here uh, is actually an 11 by 17 page kind of cut in half, just so you can see the headers and some of the base information. But for each of the facilities within the system, we went through and used, utilizing MSBA guidelines and standards, identified the current condition, uh, any existing uh, issues or concerns, identification of potential modifications or new construction within it, and then ultimately recommendations in terms of the total number of square feet needed to serve the children of the system. So we did that for each of the schools, and I'll move through these pretty quickly, but for each of the schools we were able to take this instance, Hop Hopkinton High School, and you'll see three sets of numbers. Uh, first, the design enrollment. Uh, that is, uh, as Dr. Wagner, or excuse me, as Dr. Kavanaugh identified, uh, for the high school, 1,080 students is the MSBA design enrollment. The actual enrollment, uh, we have it a bit stated differently here, uh, 1,258 for, for school year 2021, and then a maximum enrollment looking 10 years out anticipated at about 1,606 uh, students. And when we get to that point in applying the MSBA guidelines, the list of facility needs in the rightmost column are the types of spaces that will be needed to help deal with that additional population that's anticipated. And as I said, we've gone through this exercise for each of the schools, the middle school, Hopkins Elementary, the Elmwood Elementary, and Marathon. Another type of assessment is taking a look at the spaces and again utilizing MSBA standards and guidelines come to understand what is the space adequacy of the various educational spaces within the facilities? So space that is significantly undersized, greater than 20% away from the standard or the guideline recommendation, you'll see those spaces in red. Those spaces rendered in yellow are considered slightly undersized. Those in green are meeting the standard and guidelines. The blue space is for space that might be significantly beyond the standard and guideline. And then lastly, <clears throat> space that's not identified uh, as part of an MSBA standard uh, are identified in purple. And so for this facility, we went through each of the spaces and utilizing that guideline standard we're able to identify 
how the school met those ranges of recommended standards. Now, this doesn't speak to population. This just purely means if you have a classroom, is the classroom adequately sized? It doesn't speak to the other issue of when more students come, you actually need more of those spaces. And again, to move through this quickly, we did this for both the high school, for the middle school, for Hopkins Intermediate, for the Elmwood School, and then for Marathon. The second step of our process was listening. And in this, uh, Dr. John Tyndall Gibson and I, we had opportunities on three different dates to visit each of the schools. Uh, we met with administration from each of the schools. We met with selected staff from each of the schools. And we came to understand what works really well here in Hopkinton and what you'd never want to see changed. We also came to hear what issues and concerns were drawn to the table. And there's a lot of words here. Uh, I can boil it down to people are feel, feeling the space pinch today. Uh, there are significant concerns around adequacy for educational experience within the facilities, although great work is happening within the buildings. In terms of some of the greatest needs identified, more classrooms was at the top of the list. And this wasn't at a school or two schools. This was across all five that we visited. More small classroom spaces for English language, special education, Ot occupational therapy and physical therapy spaces, proper adequacy. Uh, and it goes on down through the list. You can read through them yourself. Adequate storage. I I've done this type of work for about 30 years. Storage is always a concern in any building. And it was noted by the staff and those that came to speak to us. The next stage in the work that we do is visioning. And we have a bit of a, 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 like a head start, if you will, in that we're familiar with the community through our work at the Marathon School. Um, as, as Lee touched on, uh, we worked through that project. And with that, as part of that work, we looked at various uh, parcels that may be available for educational use here in the community. And we use that work to be the backbone of what we did to develop uh, a couple options and alternatives. And as Dr. Kavanaugh said, you know, the, the work that's being attended to in the vote on Monday is very different than this. That's, you have children in the seats today and you need more seats. And that's what the six classroom edition is about, and that's what the modulars are about. This work speaks to, once you have that in place, how do you carry through the arc of the next 10 to 15 years? And, and that's what we're trying to address. It's getting to those numbers, should they get out to the 4,800 student range as compared to where you are today. The work that is proposed through what is being voted on Monday uh, is work that is needed irrespective, and it's work that doesn't have to be undone to facilitate next, next steps. So the, the work at the high school, as an example, will be utilized throughout the arc of all these various options and alternatives. So I'll share two of them. We, we went through a series, but two that we'll share. This is the uh, grade deployment as it stands today. Marathon School handles pre-K to one. Elmwood handles two, grades two to three. Hopkins Intermediate grades four to five. We have a 6-8 middle school and we have a 9-12 high school. One thing to note in terms of number of transitions, between grades one and two, there's an educational transition, a move to another school. Be between grades three and four, another transition. Five, six, a transition. And then ultimately, middle to high school, a transition. 
This is a proposed alternate structure. Uh, this speaks to Marathon continuing as a pre-K to one facility. Elmwood School uh, would be retired in this uh, thought process. A new grades two to five facility uh, would be proposed. Renovations and additions at Hopkins for a 6-7 configuration would be proposed. The middle school uh, would remain in its current facility. Uh, it would house grades eight and nine. So the shift would be in terms of who attends. And this high school, rather than being a four grade nine to 12 high school, would be proposed as a 10 to 12 high school. What that affords is the opportunity uh, by shrinking the grade numbers, both at the middle and high school level, is to still be able to use the facility but have fewer bodies coming to use it. This would be um, a diagram. Uh, we call them test fits uh, because we don't want people to think that architecture is happening. This is not meant to be design. It's simply meant to try to say, with this amount of stuff, does it fit in this container? And what we're testing here is the Tadaro site, which is the lower portion of this diagram. And in the upper portion of the diagram uh, is the existing Marathon School. The proposed facility in the lower right-hand corner of the diagram is a large facility. It houses grades two, excuse me, yes, grades uh, two through five. Uh, it would have to be a three-story facility to be able to uh, house, the, house this number within the constraints of this site. Uh, but we do feel we could get adequate roadway, parking, play area, all attendant needs around that facility. Uh, it would, in this test fit, organized in a way where there are schools within a school. So rather than having all the students in just what you might consider a larger volume school, you really are developing two schools. To the upper portion, uh, you would develop a four or five school to the lower portion. This zone, uh, a grades two, three school. The two are joined together at the middle uh, with kind of common element items. Things like cafeteria, library, uh, kitchen, administration, so on and so forth. So it does give opportunity to uh, uh, kind of centralize resources, be able to take advantage of efficiencies of scale, those types of things, and yet do it in a way where the schools are made to be act made to act as two independent schools. This represents the Hopkins School and the modifications at Hopkins that would be required. Uh, to the left-hand side of the diagram, you'll see an interesting spelling of the word addition. Uh, that is the proposed addition. It represents about 18 classrooms. And this next slide shows kind of a, a blow up of that school uh, with the addition. The addition is in the darker brown. Uh, science classrooms and general classrooms wrap around the core. A black box theater is identified at the, at the center of that space. The idea of the black box theater is that in the cafeteria, the stage area can then be taken away and additional seating for a larger population in that space. Some additional construction would be needed at administration as well as at the kitchen and storage areas of the facility to accommodate the larger populations. We've developed a, a listing of advantages and disadvantages. I, I won't go through them exhaustively, but I can touch on kind of the underlined areas, academic and fiscal benefits 
that have been identified for this arrangement, uh, facility flexibility, uh, vehicular and campus administration, and then under disadvantages, I, I did note the fact that the facility uh, to fit within the areas uh, would have to be a three-story facility. That would require uh, planning, zoning, and uh, other uh, board agencies to be able to review it and come to uh, sign off on it. Uh, it is a large school. You know, in total area, it parallels the facility here. And in terms of total enrollment, again, a, a population that gets up over 1,400 students, uh, again, those would be broken into two schools of 750 or better, but to try to minimize that impact. The last piece that I would like to share with you here quickly is an alternative uh, sample. As I said, we've done many of these, but these two we wanted to share with you this evening. Uh, Marathon School continuing as a pre-K to one, Elmwood retired, a new elementary 2-3 facility, a new intermediate 4-5 facility, and renovations to Hopkins. And from Hopkins down, it is the same as what was shown in the prior uh, sample. Uh, this is what that might look like across the area at the Tadaro site. It develops a 2-3 facility uh, just south of the existing Marathon uh, and a 4-5 facility over in the lower right-hand corner at the Tadaro site. Uh, these would be two-story facilities. Uh, these would be handling about similar populations as in the other. So you're talking about larger scale elementary schools. They're at about 750 and above at the maximum populations that are identified. The, the work needed at Hopkins parallels what we shared before, so I'm not showing it here again. And we did again list out advantages and disadvantages as we compare this to the other. Some of the disadvantages in this um, were noted that the transitions necessary to facilitate this uh, approach actually introduces one additional transition in the educational cycle. There are four in the existing, current, and proposed in the other. In this, there would be five transitions. Now we have to say, your school system does a great job of managing those transitions, and I'm sure this could be worked on here to do the same going forward, but it's just something that we'd identify as a potential disadvantage. Um, it also doesn't afford the uh, opportunities for under one roof having all resources available to serve the popula you know, a broader population, although they do share the same campus environment. So um, we can speak more about that during question and answer as well. In terms of documentation, this is a sampling of the documentation that's been developed, and, and that at this point is a quick 20-minute uh, overview of uh, the work that we've set in place to date. And with that, I'll hand it back to uh, Dr. Kavanaugh for the uh, frequently asked questions. All right, so at this time, I think it would be great for people who have questions, you can come up to the mic. Um, and again, those of you who don't want to ask your questions publicly, you can certainly help yourself to a note card back there and um, just fill them out. We'll collect them at the end. But I'm sure that you must have some questions. I know that was a lot to digest. Hi. I was hoping that one of the architects could speak to the rationale for, uh, with the high school expansion, not building out the bottom floor and essentially providing six additional classrooms rather than nine. I'm sure there's a good reason, but if you could explain the rationale behind that, it would be appreciated. Uh, yes, I, I can offer that as we studied the facility, 
Uh, the expansion zone was anticipated by the original construction committee. Uh, actually, uh, in the other wing, a similar classroom uh, expansion was actually acted on and put in place before the building opened. So during the course of construction, it had been planned for, the committee recognized it was needed at that time, they built out that one. A similar expansion in the zone that was shared was also uh, planned for. Uh, however, at the lower level, that is where the kitchen, the electrical service room is, and other uh, kind of key uh, service area uh, activities, so we weren't able to put classroom out there because that would uh, uh, limit the opportunity to access those types of spaces. Now we were able to work it out again in this quick test fit uh, to be able to egress students safely, to be able to have the construction happen simultaneously while occupied, and those types of considerations were, under, were considered. Hi, um, I'm not sure if um, if you can answer this or if this is a question for Carol and Jen, but um, obviously you guys put a lot of research into looking at impact on transportation and space and campuses, but I was wondering um, if you had given thought or done any um, research into the impact that might happen in shifting grades to different schools, particularly having eighth and ninth housed together and separating ninth from the high school. Sure, so I'll talk a little bit about that because it's, it's programmatic. Uh, we at first had some concerns, I think, about that. So ideally, we would take this building and the middle school and physically connect them so that students in grades 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 5 grades would really be able to go in between these two buildings. Uh, one of the other things that we had thought about is a lot of schools are moving to sort of that grade nine academy. How do we get grade nine students really ready for the high school experience? And so then we got to a place where we thought you could really do that over a two year period with eighth and ninth graders. And the other advantage that we felt was available to us is there's that kind of flexibility in coursework. So we have a lot of eighth grade parents who will say to us, but my student is really ready to take accelerated geometry, but that student is limited, limited by the fact that A, he has no access to the high school, or B, the high school and middle school are on two different schedules. So if we were able to take those two buildings and sort of marry them, it would open a lot more opportunity for coursework and really get us to a place where an 8-9 academy would prepare kids differently, I think, from you know, just having a typical 9-12 to 12 high school where we don't have a great 9 academy in, in any way, shape, or form at this point in time. Maybe I'll add one thing to that too. If we have a 6-7 school down the road, eventually you could have a campus where there would, might be a lot of flexibility in between the two buildings. Um, and I know that you know, we're in this building now. This, I mean, this auditorium, this auditorium will not house two of the classrooms in classrooms, two of the classes in this high school. So two classes in the high school currently are so large that you can't bring them into this auditorium for a presentation. So that would give us access to, better access to the auditorium at the, what's currently the middle school. Thanks, yeah, I had a question. Um, I noticed on those proposals that in both cases we had Elmwood being retired. And um, I know that's an older building, but was there consideration to leaving Elmwood as it is and then maybe building just one additional potential, maybe two-story school and reducing costs that way rather than retiring in that regard? Either way, no matter what. I'm just wondering if that consideration was put into play. Um, certainly, uh, Elmwood School was considered as a uh, possible space for being able to take up some of the uh, need within the, uh, within the district. Uh, there was some concern with the uh, limit, physical limitations of the site uh, in terms of being able, thank you very much, uh, some concern with the physical limitations of the Elmwood site in terms of being able to handle a larger population and the schools that 
we are identifying in these studies uh, are larger in scale, uh, certainly, than what is on the site today. Uh, the two-story stacking certainly uh, helps get you there in terms of condensing that footprint. But you also have to think about the parking, the play field, the playgrounds, all those kind of attendant services that have to be fit within the uh, facility as well. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add one quick piece to that. So when you are invited into MSBA for reimbursement, the two things that they're sort of really looking for are either um, the facility is in such deplorable condition that you need a, a new building, and that doesn't really apply to Elmwood the way it is right now, um, and the other piece is that you may have a population problem, and that is what applies to Elmwood for us. Um, you keep bringing in more kids and you know you reduce and you build out the building, but you reduce parking, you reduce all of those things that um, Jim was just talking about, so. Hi, um, I had a question, I think, for mostly for Dr. Kavanaugh, specifically about the ninth grade and the eighth grade school. Um, currently, as it stands, the ninth grade is very much intrinsically a part of the high school in that the curricular and extracurricular activities of the students are married to that of the high school. Like, as you said, students can take classes in different grades and they're freshmen who participate on varsity and JV sports and everything. But if the eighth grade and ninth grade were in a separate school under separate administration, then ninth grade would either have to kind of be decreased in, in rigor to match the eighth grade or the eighth grade would kind of have to be increased in rigor to match the current ninth grade. Would you say that the eighth and ninth grade would still function at a level comparable to that of the ninth grade and comparable to that of the rest of the high school? Or would you say that there would be changes made to the ninth grade to make it more akin to eighth grade? No, I, I don't think that the level of rigor would change. And in fact, I think that if, you know, there has to be sort of flexibility, there has to be movement between the two buildings, absolutely. And I think that if you are a ninth grader and although most of your classes might be housed in what's now the middle school, you would certainly be finding your way into the high school. You know that you have some ninth grade graders who are in classrooms with 10th graders and 11th graders for particular courses. So I would hope that that movement would, would sort of still exist. It would just be that um, we genuinely sort of need that space to have what will be five classes in buildings that now house seven classes, but it really does afford us, I think, the opportunity to create programming for grades eight and nine. I thought one of the more compelling and concerning aspects of the presentation, both on Tuesday and today, was that we are potentially not adhering to state guidelines with respect to the square footage and overall educational capacity of the schools. Using objective measures like standardized test scores, college acceptance rates, can you help me understand or the group at large what the deleterious impact has been to the educational outcomes of students in town not meeting these guidelines? Yeah, so I don't know if you are referring to, you know, as you look at those sort of colored pictures and you see that there are red spaces and that kind of things, like... I'm specifically referring to the fact that on all three slides you have us approximately 15% above what the MSBA guidelines are. Surely if we're failing to meet the state guidelines, it's having an adverse impact on the education of students in town. I'm wondering if you can help me understand what that looks like. Sure thing. So, as I've said, we, we do need to add classrooms to all of these buildings. Right now, if you think about um, and sometimes I'll, I'll show the slide where we look at our enrollment data and the number of classrooms that we have and teachers and how full those classes are getting. So we would really like to have K and 1 classrooms that have, say, 18 or 19 kids in them. Right now, our first grade classrooms have 20, 20, sorry, 22, 23, and 24 in them, right? So you say, well, what does that really look like? It looks like a teacher who has, you know, maybe a reading group that's just a little bit too large, or she sees that a kid is struggling in math but doesn't get to that student in a given day. 
And I keep telling everyone this, we can sustain this for a little while, right? And that's what we're doing right now. But over time, certainly, the quality of education in Hopkinton cannot sustain if we have way too many kids in our classrooms. Um, when you, know, you go into, and we, we looked at this, you know, we just pulled a junior schedule sort of arbitrarily this fall, and that student was taking several AP courses, and she had 27 or better students in every one of those classes. So what happens over time is there's fatigue for our teachers. You know, if I'm the person who's taking teaching uh, you know, an AP physics course and we do a lab, I am now taking home 127 labs, but in past years I might have only taken home 97. So I say to myself, I either have to practice self-care and give fewer of these, um, or I have to take time away from my family and, and give as many as I want. So I, I really feel like we are we are in a place now where the toothpaste is sort of out of the tube and we, you know, we're sustaining, but it can't last like this forever, which is why we need those classrooms for next year. Um, I know that right now at Hopkins, for example, we are at 12 and 12, 12 fourth grades, 12 fifth grades. Next year, we're going to be at 14 fourth grades and 14 fifth grades. I'm absolutely with you, and I, I appreciate the detailed response. And as a professional myself, I certainly understand and appreciate that you're reflecting work-life balance. That speaks very well of the administration that you're running and the concern for the people who work for you. So thank you for that on behalf of the town in general. But I want to be very clear and explicit in the follow-up here. Sure. It is your specific response here that there is no diminished educational outcome in the current stance with respect to violation or non-adherence to the MSBA guidelines with respect to standardized test scores. <laughs> college enrollment rates, et cetera. You're saying we're maintaining. I'm asking a very specific and objective question. Are we actively at this moment negatively impacting in a measurable way the educational outcomes of the students in town? I think that's a compelling metric as we ask for additional funds, which I fully support. I would say yes to that. I, I would definitely say yes to that. Can you quantify that for us? And I mean, I will probably be able to quantify it as scores continue to come in. But I, I want to also be clear about metrics. And so when we talk about the metrics that we use, you as people who li are living in the community, you get to see things like the AP scores maybe, or you get to see things like um, the MCAS scores that come out. But what you don't know is that every principal sitting in this room keeps watch lists of our kids. And on those sheets of paper, what we have are BAS data, QRI data, star reading data, star math data, uh, access data. So I could ramble on and on about all the data, but there are hundreds and hundreds of scores. And what we're finding is that you know, if you were a special educator who used to be responsible for eight students and now you're responsible for 16, those reading scores are harder to keep at par. Um, so we are have finding that we have more kids who are reading below grade level, and that's, that's not a fib at the elementary level. So yes, we can actually quantify that. And over time, so if you have a kid who's reading below grade level in grade three, and we work assiduously, try to get him back to grade level, but if we don't, the gap keeps getting wider and wider. And by the time that student is testing in grade eight or grade 10, you're not going to be getting the same scores in Hopkinton that you used to get. We absolutely need classrooms, we need teachers, we, we, we have to have those things if you want to remain where you are in the top five in the state. Um, do you have an estimate for when these facilities would come online or for these options, what would be the estimated uh, construction and bring them uh, online in the system? So I'll let the architects answer that a little bit as well, but I have already said that we were we have a statement of interest in with the MSBA. What happens is you get invited in, technically, and then you start to do a whole lot of research, and there's a feasibility study. And what typically happens from the time you are invited in to the day that you open the doors, um, it's typically about five years' time. So really, our first order of business would be, and the statement of interest we put in was for the Elmwood School, so our first order of business would really be to think about how to get Elmwood to a place different from where it is right now. And who knows? I mean, MSBA could come in and say, we are absolutely not going to fund uh, two different schools over on 
um, Hayden Rose Street, or maybe they are, that would come out of a feasibility study. We've got all this research and we've got data and this is, you know, for some people they're looking at this thinking this is kind of exciting, but if we are looking at reimbursement, it's, it's probably a long way out. You know, and that's why we say we need classrooms today in that temporary sense, but we also need to be thinking about what's going to happen in 10 years and it's time to act. Like, we don't have a lot of time to be standing around thinking, what will we do? We need to know what we're going to do. Okay. Um, a couple questions. One, um, what was blaring out was that there was no renovation for the middle school. I mean, I saw what you said about connecting it, but we, the middle school is desperately need. I mean, it was the high school for years. Um, I don't see that on the map. And in less than 20 years, we've built three schools. And when I look at the surrounding communities, not one of those has done that. Can we look at building schools that hold four grades at a time, build them taller, build them <laughs> bigger? <laughs> yeah, I guess part of our trouble, and I, I think that this is part of the trouble for a lot of people, if you use MSBA reimbursement, they are very rigid about um, the number of classrooms that you build, right? So they, they don't want you to look at your current population and say, wait, in the year 2930, we're going to have 4,850 students in Hopkinton because they'll say, prove it. And as we said at the beginning of tonight's presentation, there is no way to actually prove that that's going to happen. Right now, we have science that's contributing to this information. And you know, hopefully, what we have there is accurate, and we can argue with the MSBA. But at the end of the day, if they are willing to reimburse you for X number of classrooms, I would say that the district then would need to think about, or the community would need to think about, do you want to add out-of-pocket classrooms when you're building um, either you know, new elementary schools or adding on to, say, something like Hopkins, right? Did I fully answer your question, darling? Oh, you asked also about the middle school? Yeah, middle school innovation and why aren't the class, why are we still looking at schools that are just two grades instead of building Yes, well one of those options is technically a four grade school. So it would do two, three, four, five. Two, three would be housed in one sec side of it, four, five would be housed and it would have a shared core. It's nice to do that because in terms of transportation, kids in two, three, four, five, or all the way K to five could be dropped off in those same places and it takes that traffic off of Hayden Row. But you can also concentrate programming. So if you wanted to build sort of a, you know, a Down syndrome program or an autism program or a particular special education or L program or art program or any of those things, you can do that far more cost effectively in a two, three, four, five school than you can in a two, three, where you'd have to build one of those programs, and a four, five, where you'd have to build one of those programs. And about the middle school, I think that that would probably be one of our last orders of business, but I don't disagree with you that the middle school is desperate for a facelift. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> hello, so uh, I think a key point for me as I've listened to the presentations is that we were almost apologetic about needing to plan for a third story on the new school, on the two through five school. And I think in the past, we haven't thought in terms of capacity, growth, and opportunity on our structures. We've built to the parcel as accorded. Uh, and so fortunately for the high school, we had this opportunity to add on six more classrooms. But why aren't we taking these plans up to four stories and building to a smaller footprint so that should the need come, we have that opportunity to add additional classrooms, additional structures to the same existing school and we're not looking to have to build a whole new school, we're just putting on a wing. Thank you. It's a great question and it's one that looks to the future uh, for each of uh, each of the projects that are sponsored through MSBA, the ability to demonstrate expansion is something that's built into each. Uh, this building is an example of that. This predates MSBA. It was under SBA. They similarly had a, the same type of request that expansion be made part of any project that they are funding. Uh, so we are taking, take, we have already taken advantage of 
uh, that here at this building with the initial expansion and looking to take advantage of that pre-planning with the proposed six classroom addition. As we worked on Marathon School, the administration worked very closely with MSBA and tried to press them to understand that the numbers here in Hopkinton were different. And that conversation went on for a very long time. But the state identifies the buildable number, meaning they, they establish the amount of square feet in a building. Uh, they resist very much the idea that you are going to break outside of their recommend, recommended amounts. Uh, during the course of construction at the Marathon School, the numbers were on the table and it was evident that there were more students than was being planned for. And we took that information back to the state and the administration here did a great job. It was the first time in my experience, and as I said earlier, I've been doing this for about 30 years, where I have seen the state actually in process approve an expansion. And so Marathon had a four classroom expansion happen during the course of construction and still has an area for expansion outside the footprint of the building. The numbers that we're talking about here are very different than that though. These are large numbers in terms of the projections where simple expansions on each building uh, almost becomes impossible. Uh, so if I, if I may ask a follow on to that. So Marathon is an example. <clears throat> My I think we built two stories tall and so why didn't we build that three stories tall? My understanding is, although we've already done the addition for four classrooms, we already need another four classrooms. So Marathon's already too small. So what I'm asking is that if we're going to put the capital into new structures, let's build them high and plan for the opportunity to grow with wings if necessary, as compared to Marathon already being too small. Thank you. Hi, Carol. I actually have two questions. Okay. My first one is about the uh, traffic situation on Route 85, if all seven grades are both going and coming at the same time. I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm I had actually put it in the frequently asked questions. Um, I feel like there are a lot of people who are afraid of putting more traffic on Hayden Row Street. But here's what I would say to that. If you went to all of the parents who drop a student off at the Elmwood School and you said, how many of you have a student who either goes to the middle school or Hopkins or Marathon, most of those parents at Elmwood would say, I do. So they're coming over here anyway. And I don't know how carefully you looked at those drawings, but the drawings are amazing in that they take, there is a means for buses to go in and drop kids off in one part of a building, cars to go in and drop students off at either three locations or two locations. But what I have learned from World Tech Engineering is that if you are able to pull traffic off of Hayden Road Street successfully and give them a course to follow all the way through the schools and then get back on Hayden Road Street, it actually it does not really create a whole lot more traffic. And it, it will actually pull traffic off of Hayden Road Street. I know that that sounds crazy, but, and, I, and I'll, I'll tell you my, my lived experience, when we had this building and we had rerouted traffic two years ago, I kept saying, oh my goodness, those World Tech engineers, I'm not a transportation engineer, I don't play one on TV, but this is going to be a mess out there. And somehow, when we pulled all of those people off onto the loop road and then brought them in that side entrance of the high school, there was a lot less traffic out there on Hayden Row Street. It actually flowed pretty well. Um, so that's the ticket, is finding a way to have something that runs parallel to Hayden Row where cars are able to travel. Thank you. My other question is, we saw the plans for the buildings. We're wondering, or I'm wondering, what are the plans for the staffing, the teachers, and the budgetary requirements that are gonna come with that? 
That is definitely going to change the operating budget for the Hopkinton Public Schools. It has to. And you know that the operating budget, about 80% of that goes in to personnel salaries, right? And so if we are adding personnel, obviously with 80% of, of that be, of the operational budget being per personnel salaries, it's going to increase. It has to. If you have way more children, and I always say that for about 20 students, you need 1.4, 1.5 teachers, and I know that that might be difficult to understand, but you've got to remember that you've got art, music, PE, special education, OTPT, speech, principals, assistant principals, you've got all of those people who have contact with kids. So every time we have 20 students, we need about 1.4, 1.5 kids. We are going to have to add staff. Just a quick follow-up for the naive on the MSBA guidelines. So following up sort of on Alton's question here, as we talk about building potentially larger schools, what's the rationale for adhering and participating? Are we given supplemental budget from the state if we adhere to the current in front of us definition of the students we see rather than projections? And to our consultants over there, are we confident looking forward that building a school now and then the supplemental modular expansions, which are 10 million in capital alone this year, outweigh simply foregoing the state supplements and building, to Alton's point, the right school at the right height. I'd like to understand that I'm paying the bill once and not for the next 10 years. Based on the current school 10-year forecast, it looks like I'll be paying it for the next 10 years. Well, I'll just say one thing quickly before handing this off to, to Jim. Uh, I'm going to say two things quickly. So the modular classrooms that we're talking about, uh, there is potentially some resale value in them. The resale value comes to you um, dependent upon the demand in the market at the time that you want to sell them. Um, and the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of your question is, it always makes sense to go for the reimbursement. The question becomes, when MSBA puts a limit on what you're able to build, is the town willing to say, we'll build more on our own dime? Right, that, that's what it comes down to. I would uh, offer that the, the question of foregoing reimbursement uh, is a very difficult question for a community to entertain. There are very few communities that I'm aware of uh, that have done that um, and have chosen to go that road. Uh, we operate in many other communities with significantly lower reimbursements that, than what the state offers here in Hopkinton. And those communities continue to pursue that, that reimbursement. To the question earlier about expansion and the possibility of building higher, uh, we have worked in communities where they have chosen to put in the infrastructure, put in the structural reinforcement, put in the larger capacity for distribution, boilers, et cetera. Uh, it's a very difficult challenge to act on that in the future. The act of constructing over-occupied space, as you can imagine, and particularly in a school environment, uh, a difficult thing to entertain. So that is something that has to be carefully thought through and, and thought of in terms of uh, does it really afford you the flexibility that you're hoping to purchase early on and purchase it once. Uh, and I guess those are a few observations. So I, I would ask one very quick follow-up, and it's okay if you don't respond, which would be, as part of the work you've done for us, was a cost-benefit analysis and projection done of the estimated cost of continuing to supplement the schools relative to what the MSPA would let us build versus the projected enrollment rate. And to the larger group here at WIT, I would simply say I've lived in town for two years at no point in time has anything this school system has requested ever been denied. Is there a single person here who would not vote to support a larger school, a larger footprint, and a larger cost? My stance would be probably not. Hi. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a high school teacher. 
<laughs> uh, I, could, I had two parts. I had concerns that there was uh, nothing that seems to address the need for more bathrooms in the immediate um, addition for the high school. And no, no talk about changing the cafeteria cooking area. I appreciate that you already recognize that the cafeteria is too small to ho house the students. I think the administration here has alleviated that by adding a fourth lunch. But the cooking space in the cafeteria setup um, is not working well. So I would like to know why that's not being addressed in just talking about six classrooms. You are correct. We haven't studied the uh, kitchen area and uh, its capacities as it stands. Uh, we have taken a tour of the facility. We have understanding of the, the plans for it. Uh, the sizing of it would seem sizing that I would expect be able to handle not only the capacity that's in place today, but the proposed, assuming the six classrooms are acted on. The real issue that the six classrooms addresses is the fact that a high school, when it reaches a utilization rate of 85, is considered fully occupied. This high school operates at about 93 or 94 mm percent. -hmm. So it's well above that kind of guideline that educational planners and programmers would apply to a high school experience. Those six classrooms are very needed simply to address that flexibility in programming here within the school to meet the needs that are on the ground today. I don't disagree. But if you're doing an addition, why are we not talking about putting in some bathrooms at that same time? We are adding the, uh, uh, some toilets, uh, I believe, on the third floor to address uh, the requests of the teachers. That is in the plan. Um, so I, I just ask that you would really look at the cooking area. Part two, um, I've heard you talk a lot about classrooms, classrooms, classrooms. Please keep in mind that play fields are also classrooms. I lost my classroom last year with the bus parking lot. Those play fields are not only playground and recreation time, but they are a classroom. And they are also part of educating a student. So I'd ask that you please keep that in mind. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. So, Mina, maybe you could be our last question. Is that okay? I hope so. Is that all? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to be you, sorry. Oh, would you like to cognizant of time. No, it's okay. I mean... Uh, for those of you who don't know, I serve as chair of the Hopkinton School Committee. Uh, I appreciate all the thought and effort that has gone in. And I know this is only the first iteration and this is the first time uh, we are also looking at it as a board. And I'm sure we will deliberate later today and you know, this will be a long journey for all of us. Um, I just have a quick question for Dr. Wagman um, with regard to the projections. The number 234 is, is a, you know, it's not 230 to 235, it's not giving us a range. So I'm wondering, you know, having some background in analytics myself, typically when we come up with projections, there's a confidence level that is given along with um, any kind of projection. So I'm wondering, uh, with the projections that have been put forth, is there a confidence level or a range? Um, how, how do you come up with this number? Um, you know, again, specific to confidence level. Thank you. You, you, you have to understand that uh, these numbers are not uh, finite numbers. They are, in fact, estimates. The report has been put together based upon a number of assumptions. The assumptions are that the birth rate is going to continue at a particular rate, uh, that uh, the residential development uh, will continue at a particular rate. Now, I know that over the past several years, the uh, legacy farms uh, issue has seemed to consume most of the oxygen in the room, but uh, you have to understand that what we put together uh, over and above the cohort survival, which is, as Dr. Kevin or explained, is a mathematical algorithm, uh, we look at it in much more humanistic terms. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time in 
Hopkinton talking to people. And we look at these numbers not in terms of them simply being a mathematical exercise, but in terms of how they in fact uh, reflect not only what's going on in Hopkinton today, but what is going to be occurring in Hopkinton over the next several years. One of the things that we looked at, and I had a long conversation with the town principal planner, John Gelchik, uh, was the amount of new residential construction that's taking place over and above uh, the legacy farms uh, issue. And uh, in the report, in our report, we project that including legacy farms, there will be approximately 242 additional students that we can identify over the next two to three to four years. If we take legacy farms out of that, we still have almost 100 students that we can identify coming from other uh, residential construction in the town. And long after legacy farms becomes a topic of history, uh, there is going to be continued development of new homes in the town of Hopkinton. Hopkinton is a very desirable community. Uh, a lot of people want to live here, and a lot of people come here because of the excellent schools. So the number that we have projected, and we have been told by some people that the numbers perhaps are a bit too aggressive. Uh, we don't think so, but nevertheless, you have to understand that if the assumptions on which we made these projections change, if the economy falters, uh, if the real estate sector uh, contracts, uh, if birth rates fall, a number of things can happen over the next 10 years. So yes, these are estimates but they're based on the best information that we have right now and the best information we have going forward. And as again, again, you have to understand that they are estimates. They are not numbers that are cast in concrete. And as situations change over the years, those numbers will fluctuate. But overall, we don't think that they are going to vary drastically from what we have projected based upon what we know about what's going on in the town right now. I appreciate your answer very much. I was just wondering about the range. And perhaps it's not a general practice in this particular industry to give a range of projection. So I, I can appreciate that. And my hope is that, you know, obviously, which things which are far out, 10 years out, those are things which are more unpredictable. Hopefully, the ones which are nearer in future, the accuracy rates would be higher. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that uh, what you're saying is, is very apt. Uh, it is necessary to keep, uh, keep tuned to what's going on in the town. We can't assume that the numbers we project today are going to be exactly uh, what we said they might be 10 years out, because circumstances are going to change along the way. And it is necessary to look at what's going on in the community economically, socially, demographically, so that if these shifts occur, we will be uh, able to respond to them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Bagman. I've heard of all the good work you've done in Connecticut, too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi. I can appreciate the um, academic and economic um, benefits of, say, marrying an eighth and ninth cohort and then a tenth through twelfth cohort. But I'm wondering about the social and emotional. Um, I, I, immediately, I have concerns when you, when you think about eighth and 12th graders merging in a school setting. But um, I'm, I'm guessing that there are some examples that you could provide of where this has happened before and what, what are the successes, what are the hang-ups about that? Yeah, so I think that, you know, there have been school districts that will put their eighth graders into that high school sort of setting. 
Um, and a lot of times it happens for similar reasons to what's happening here that you know it's you have two buildings that will accommodate sort of five grades. And so in that process, we're really trying to be very thoughtful about keeping our eighth graders and ninth graders in a place, but allowing them to move into the high school, the 10 to 12 building, when they need to access 10 to 12 curriculum. Um, and this is not a decision that has been made, but maybe that also allows eighth grade students who want to access you know, high school sports. Um, and when you have programs like you do in this building that are amazing SEL programs, you don't have to have two different programs in two different buildings any longer. You know, the kids can sort of access that pretty regularly, uh, readily. Um, I do understand that whole notion that if you are 14, you're very different from a kid who is 17 and a half or 18. And so the kids who would be coming into this building who sort of Ill exhibit the readiness for things like, you know, I say accelerated geometry, but those will tend to be students who have, you know, a particular maturity as well. So um, I'm really not that worried about eighth grade students kind of mingling with 12th grade students. At this point in time, you know, they could, you know, they ride a bus together in some cases if you have a 12th grader who happens to ride the bus. My guess is not a lot of them are riding the bus, uh, but you, you will keep them in sort of two different spaces, you know what I mean? Yeah. The ones who would be interacting with 18 year olds, I guess I would say would be either more mature or be doing that in athletics. Uh, first, I want to apologize because I know you wanted that to be the last question, <clears throat> but I just wanted to give the perspective from the executive side. The, uh, I'm a member of the Board of Selectmen. Now, this is just my opinion, but um, <clears throat> before town meeting, I just want to say this, is, this couldn't come at a better time. Well, at, at, in 2020, it, this may have been mentioned before that the high school is going to be falling off the, um, the debt schedule. And if there's any time that we actually can, now as a member of the Board of Selectmen, we're always trying to keep taxes low and not spend any more and everything else. But this is an investment. And if there's any, if there's any time that's, that's a good time to make an investment, it is really in 2020. And that's why well, when we're talking about the new classrooms and the additions and everything else, this is really the best time to look at it. And um, I just wanted to give that perspective that we really can afford it. We can do it because of the high school falling off the debt schedule, and we really do have a lot of room in there, basically, in our mortgage. So that's... Maybe one last thing that I will say, Kim, too, is in terms of socialization, your eighth and ninth graders would still sort of have their own cafeteria, their own administrators, which makes it just a little bit different, I think, than eight to 12 just being put together. Uh, so I hate to cut people off if there are still questions in the room, but I do want to be cognizant of the fact that we had a regularly scheduled school committee meeting at 7 o'clock this evening, and we do have people waiting to present their budgets to us, so I would like to kind of get going. But if uh, you have lingering questions, please fill out those cards in the back of the room, and please feel free to leave them right up front here, and we will get you the answers. Whether your name is on that card or not, we will at some point in time be able to publish, broadcast, air, whatever, those, those uh, answers to your questions. And again, I want to thank people for coming here tonight. I know it's not easy to be out here on a Thursday evening. It's cold. You have a lot going on in your lives. So it's, it's really impressive that this number of people could come out and, and just hear some ideas about um, the future of the Hopkinton Public Schools. So thank you. Good evening. I'd like to call our regular school committee meeting to order. Uh, we are starting a little late tonight at 7.34 p.m. Um, if anyone of the members uh, who joined us for the public hearing would like to stay and uh, watch us deliberate on various topics, you're welcome. Uh, I would like those present and willing to please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to the flag of the United States of Republic, which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, 
Thank you. With that, we move on to our next item on the agenda, recognitions. Trusha Puttaraju. Is she here? She is. Trusha, please come on up. Uh, what's the best way? Perhaps that way. So last year around like the winter time, my family family and I went into Boston just to celebrate the Christmas spirit. And um, while enjoying Boston itself, I did notice there's a lot of homeless families um, on the streets that were suffering through the cold New England w winter. And it left me kind of upset and I was really empowered after seeing what I saw in Boston and seeing how many people had to suffer. I was definitely empowered to try to do something and change it. So um, after that December, I started contacting a lot of sock companies throughout the country, and thankfully one of them responded and were willing to donate a thousand socks to me. And obviously I don't know exactly where to hand the socks out, so I decided to contact the Boston Police Department and they helped me. So I was able to give my thousand socks to them, and um, throughout the course of this winter, they're going to be patrolling around Boston and handing out these socks to any family or children who need them this winter. <laughs> Great. What's next? Um, I definitely want to continue this. I started off with socks and a little bit of food this year, but if I stay in the Boston area, or really any city I go to, I hope to expand on it and maybe go into socks and um, other es essential items like toothbrushes or even more uh, winter apparel. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank, that, that you. Great Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent job, Trisha. Uh, you were all over Facebook. That's how I learned of it. <laughs> so you. thank you so much for continuing to uh, doing this good work, and I hope you continue to do that. Thank you. Good luck. Thank well you. done. Thank Great you. job, Trisha. <laughs> Does anyone else have any recognitions? Oh, I just wanted to note that uh, Mr. Bishop is not here tonight to present his budget. Um, very tragically, Larry Keene, who had been a longtime custodian here at the high school, retired last June, and uh, unfortunately he passed away last week, and so Mr. Bishop is delivering a eulogy this evening at a service for Mr. Keene, so that's why he's not with us. And I'd like to just um, recognize Mr. Keene because he had a fondness for the kids, and the kids had a fondness for him. He was a wonderful contribution to our, our public schools. Um, I actually have two on my end, and uh, to do that, I actually want to read something um, off of one of the folks that I want to call out and recognize. Um, it says on the top of the Hill program uh, flyer, we must judge a country not only by the men it produces, but by the men it honors, by the men it remembers. And I'm sure when JFK said it, he meant men and women. Um, and the person I want to recognize and call out today is Mary Pratt. Um, she was 91 years old and um, she recently passed away and her funeral was today. Unfortunately, we were not able to go. Um, and my condolences to the family, but my understanding, I did not know her personally, um, but I've heard great things about her, about the work she has done. These are people who were before us on school committees, on the select board, who have done such great work to bring our district where it is today. My understanding is that she advocated for kids with special needs when it was not even a thing. Um, now, that's somebody with a vision and foresight. I believe she was extremely passionate. Um, it's unfortunate I did not get a chance to get to know her. Um, so I would like to take a moment to remember her. Thank you. 
Um, the other person that I want to recognize is Mr. Josh Hanna. Uh, it was my pleasure and honor to actually attend the Top of the Hill program um, maybe a week or so ago, just before Thanksgiving. Um, I thought it was a fabulous program and his vision and planning and how it all um, was laid out was fabulous. Uh, I think we need more people uh, being, uh, you know, coming up with ideas of this nature where you continue to remember, you know, those who have moved on and get some of their ideas back and get students, actually it was students who were presenting the award. Um, so a huge shout, shout out to Mr. Han. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. Well, he's not. Uh, so, yeah, that's all I had for recognitions. So we are on to the public um, comment section of our agenda tonight. Is there anyone here who would like to make a public comment? Okay, yes not. So we will move straight to reports and budget presentations. Mr. Cormier, our athletics director. <laughs> you must be super excited tonight's your night based on where we're sitting tonight, oh, right? Yes, terrific. great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, well, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. I think you all have uh, had a chance to look over the executive summary, so I'm certainly not going to bore uh, everyone to tears reading this through. Um, you know, we worked really hard, uh, and, and I'm not going to lie, it was certainly a challenge for me. Um, basically starting a budget process within my first few weeks uh, was certainly not easy, but I will say um, I had a lot of support. Uh, Susan was a tremendous resource for me, uh, giving me some, some you know, historical data to work from. Uh, Mr. Bishop, um, uh, Mr. Pearson, who, who's uh, psyched to be here, I'm sure, as well. Uh, you know, it was really, really helpful for me to, to have some sort of historical perspective to know what we might need in the spring of 2021 when I haven't been through the spring here ever. Um, so with that in mind, I really appreciate the help that was, was given to me as I, as I you know, tried to build uh, the most responsible budget that, that we could put together. Um, the biggest increases um, are certainly um, somewhat in fixed costs. Um, you know, our coaches' salaries are set to go up. Um, and we have a very large coaching staff. So even though the, the individual increases are, are not substantial increases uh, for the coaches themselves, when you, when you multiply that out, it becomes a pretty substantial increase. Um, transportation, <clears throat> again, the, just the cost is going up. The number of teams we have uh, continues to increase uh, with some of the new teams that we've added over the past couple of years. Our teams, thankfully, do very, very well uh, come state tournament time. Uh, if you look at I know we're talking about next year's budget, but if you look at just this fall and where some of our tournament teams traveled, uh, Nauset, Fall River, Attleboro, Mattapoisett, Plymouth, I mean, just those bus trips alone, is, it's significant. Um, so these are things that are, you know, more or less out of our hands to some extent. And um, so really those were the biggest increases when it came to um, our contracted services and our personnel budget. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We do have two uh, personnel requests in here, uh, one of which is going, uh, trying to increase our current administrative assistant position from 0.5 to 1.0. Um, and as I mentioned in here, we are the largest uh, athletic program uh, in the Tri-Valley League. And just to try to keep up with the constant flow of paperwork and students, uh, with 72 teams, well over 500 athletes per season. The fall, we had over 700 athletes. Um, there's just a lot that goes on on a daily basis. And then I try to get out to the fields, the courts, wherever. So that's, again, time I'm not in the office, able to process you know, some of the things that needs to be done in there. Um, so having a, a full-time administrative assistant, I just think, would make us a much more efficient um, department than, than we already try to be. Um, the other one is, uh, as I'm sure you know, we now have a middle school football team who just finished its second year. Um, and we already saw tremendous growth, really, from year one to year two. Um, this is open to seventh and eighth graders. Um, and we look to have close to 60 players uh, coming out for next year's team with, with currently two coaches. Um, so I've asked for a, another assistant coach uh, for this program. Um, certainly we know with football, the, the, the safety is the primary concern. 
And for many of these um, football players, and I shouldn't say just young men either, we did have one female football player as well on this year's middle school team. Um, for many of them, it's their first time playing contact football. So we really need to make sure we have that supervision, that they're being taught properly, um, and they're getting the instruction and feedback that they need to, to make sure they're playing this in a safe environment. And I think having that third coach will really allow us to do that. Um, again, that's still a 20 to 1 you know, uh, player to coach ratio. Um, but I still think that's at least manageable to make sure that we are keeping our kids safe. Um, to try to help account for uh, some of these increases, uh, we did um, find some, some areas we were able to cut within our supply budget. Um, and that really is, is thanks to the fact that there's already been a lot of great work already done. Um, so our equipment, um, our substantial equipment needs are in pretty good shape. Um, with the turf field came a lot of new equipment as well. Um, so we are thankfully not you know, in, in need of any substantial uh, equipment purchases. So we were able to find some, some ways to cut money there um, to, to somewhat account, um, you know, for the increases in those other areas. So I don't know if you guys have any questions or... I have none. I thought you did a great job for your first round. The <laughs> executive great. summary was very, you know, thorough, very easy to read. You definitely um, justified all the things that you put on there, so you did a good job. It's very clear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to thank you for for being out and being visible on the fields. I think, um, you know, I, I fully respect the need to have um, some help, some administrative help, and going from half to full time support. But having your visibility out there makes a huge difference on um, just how the teams react and, uh, and represent the school. So I appreciate that effort to get out there. It's great. Um, the only question I really had uh, was, well, two questions. I just wanted to ask if Susan could help un us understand the 78,000. I know there was some accounting um, cleanup of, I think maybe it was, of the 78,000 that was listed as a reduction in gate receipts. But I don't know that that's actually what it was. I'm not sure if you could talk to that number. Yeah, so it's not a reduction in gate receipts. As you know, we use a certain amount of our revolvings to offset the budget every year. Um, circuit breaker, uh, bus fees, athletic fees, etc. So what we have been doing, what I have been doing since I've been here, is really trying to line up what we're using as an offset to line up with what the revenue is that's coming in for that fund. Um, so what you see with this is really that correction in the athletic fees. Mm -hmm. So two years ago, we did the correction in Circuit Breaker, which was a large correction. It was about 300,000. Um, so ideally, you don't want to make all these corrections all in one year. You want to slowly pull it down so that it becomes a uh, sustainable funding source. So the athletic um, funding that we were using to offset the budget was still too high based on our receipts. So this is a lineup to what we're bringing in in revenue. It is not a decrease in revenue. It's a decrease in what we're using to offset the budget. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate the, the effort, too, to make it uh, reflect reality, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, the and, and I apologize, sorry, I apologize for how I worded that. I, I should, I, it is somewhat of a decrease, but it's not like from last year to this year that we took in you know, 78,000 less. It's kind of what was set aside for years was not really what we were taking in. Um, so this was an attempt to correct that. So I should have worded that a little bit clearer. And that's really actually my move. That's not <laughs> what Mr. Cormier had, is doing with the budget. I'm the one that looks at where our revenues are and creates those offsets or determines those offsets based on revenue. It's all good. It's a good, it's a good accounting cleanup. That's good. Um, the only other question I had for you was, um, with the growth, with the size of the program, I've heard fabulous things about our new trainer. Um, do, is our training capacity sufficient? You know, it, it's a challenge uh, with the number of students that she sees. If you ever came into her office at 1.50, 2 o'clock, it is, it's packed. Um, we do have a lot of uh, students that, some of it minor, and some of it's more significant as she's working with students on return to play from head injuries and so forth. Um, 
what we do, and, and we do have it budgeted in there, we do have some additional training that we, we do have to, uh, on occasion, bring in additional trainers when we have so many events going on at the same time. So we do try to account for that uh, in our budget. Not so much the day-to-day -day stuff after school, um, but in terms of coverage of our events, we do have some money built into our budget uh, to help us cover all these different events so that we always have a trainer, particularly at our varsity events. And that speaks to, again, to what we talked about last week, sort of that hidden um, fee, cost, whatever associated with the growth in the number of students, is things like this. Like you need an administrative assistant to help you out with the massive amounts of paperwork as a result of 400 new students in the last few years. You know, you need help with, you know, everything that you've basically listed out tonight. Is you know, when we have, like, now the middle school football team, an unintended consequence of that is we need to have a trainer on a middle school football field. Yeah. That tends to happen the same time we have varsity soccer, varsity field hockey going on, who also needs to have a trainer. You know, typically we don't schedule during varsity football games for that reason, but there's no way to avoid when middle school football is playing on a Wednesday afternoon, right, to not have a soccer game or a field hockey game. So it's definitely a, a bit of a challenge. And this year with Triple E certainly added to that because we couldn't even stagger games so that the trainer go, could go from one event to another event. And unfortunately, we might be looking at that, you know, for a few years based on, on the cycles of Tripoli. Mr. Supposed to press this. Mr. Palmier, again, you know, great first year presentation here. Um, I guess, you know, typically when I look at requests for administrative assistance, my, my first reaction is to put whatever money we have towards teachers. But with the growth that we are seeing, and challenges that are coming up, you absolutely need, I want to you know, echo what some of my colleagues have said here, you need all the support possible to free you up, to look at all the work that needs to be done, um, whether it's safety concerns, whether it is programming. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, I, I fully support this and I hope this helps you with your work. Thank you very much. I was also very cheered to see that the United Sports teams have moved from being pilots to more permanent programs. Yes, absolutely. Because that's some of the best work we do yeah. with those kids. No doubt about it. If you yeah. get a chance to come to one of our unified games, they're oh, the best. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Romney. All right, thank you, you very much. If you have any much. events that you would like us to attend, please send us an email. We would love to yeah. oh, absolutely. come and cheer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Dr. Kavanaugh, you said Mr. Bishop is not here tonight, right? Yes. Um, so next up, Mr. Keller. <laughs> it's not usually such a long walk. <laughs> <laughs> the walk of shame. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, you saw in the executive summary for the FY21 uh, middle school budget, uh, we have a projected increase of 93 students, which gets us to a total of 952 total students. Again, that's projected numbers. Uh, my initial personal personnel request totaled $261,395 and included three classroom teachers. Uh, after meeting with Dr. Kavanaugh, that personal personnel request uh, has been reduced to $127,251. <clears throat> and that includes um, one teacher, and that's a world language teacher, and that would be to address class sizes. Currently, we have 4.8 foreign language teachers. Um, and in the current uh, year, we have nine classes that are over 25 students. And we have two teachers whose student load exceeds 120 students. Uh, the second position that I'm looking to, to add is uh, restoring our half-time assistant principal. So this was a budget cut in the current year um, where it's Mrs. Lape's position, which was full-time. We reduced it to half-time uh, for this current year. Um, so I'm looking to restore that back to full-time. Um, in the current year, um, observations and evaluations have been a, a significant struggle for Mrs. Ben Benek and I, so there's been minimal and sometimes, uh, to this point, no um, classroom presence, uh, uh, just in terms of the number of staff that we have with Mrs. Lape going to half time. Uh, and also with the number of students that we're looking to increase next year, uh, I believe strongly that three full-time administrators are essential. Uh, I'm looking to also restore a .5 guidance secretary. That was an FY19 budget cut. Uh, with the number of new student registrations we've had over the years, um, general operations of the counseling office, our guidance counselors are now teaching classes, so there are times when uh, there isn't somebody in the guidance office. Uh, it's helpful to have somebody there to greet students and uh, um, give them information. 
uh, as well as just uh, paperwork and different things that happen uh, with student records. Uh, and then I'm looking to add uh, two stipends. The first is an open gym supervisor. So um, currently when students come to the school at 7 o'clock and before homeroom, which starts at 725, um, they go to the auditorium or the cafeteria. Uh, and so uh, we've provided an opportunity for them to go into the gymnasium and we've taken out uh, equipment for them to uh, engage in physical activity, exercise. Uh, and there's a lot of research out there that talks about the benefits of that. And so as that program has increased in popularity, we have an increasing need for supervision. And uh, Mrs. Ben Benick and I are pulled in different places in the morning. Um, so uh, feeling strongly that we need some supervision uh, in that. And then the second stipend position that I'm looking to add is a bus slot supervisor. And uh, this would be to supervise, guide, and greet students um, when uh, they arrive at the bus lot. Uh, as you know, um, when, when students used to arrive in the, in the bus loop, uh, that was much closer to the middle school, so it was a short walk uh, to the middle school. The bus lot has made things so much easier, um, but it's also quite a distance away from the middle school. So um, having somebody at the doors to greet students and make sure it's only students coming into the, into the middle school uh, is one thing, but that's too far away from where uh, students depart the buses and making sure that they're safe uh, departing those buses. So I believe that's an, an uh, essential uh, piece as well. Um, so those are the personnel uh, requests. And then in terms of expenses, um, we have 30 textbook and supply accounts. Uh, I want to give credit to the curriculum leaders and the subject matter leaders uh, in that 15 of those 30 textbook and supply accounts are at or below FY20. And given our increase in enrollment, I think that's um, uh, impressive that they were able to uh, either meet or go below those. Um, we have six total accounts that, are over, that, are in, that have an increase of over $1,100. And so I'll talk uh, briefly about those six that I found to be um, $1,100 was kind of the, the watermark. Uh, math and engineering are both due to enrollment, so we're um, adding math textbooks, um, acquiring textbook licenses uh, because of the increasing enrollment. Uh, so that account is going up by uh, $4,696, $4,696. Our engineering supply account, we're increasing by $2,275 because needing additional VEX robotic kits. Um, we're looking to increase our guidance to supply account by $1,298. Our START program, which is our short-term transition program, was a grant-funded program. Uh, that is no longer grant-funded, and so uh, we're rolling that, um, the resources and supplies needed for that program into our guidance um, supply account. Uh, social studies curriculum has changed with new frameworks, and so uh, we are in need of wall maps for the, the change in curriculum at grade six. Uh, our physical education supply account, we're looking to increase that by $4,096 for the purchase of mats uh, for the expansion of floor programs in our PE classes. And then finally, um, there's a $2,500 increase in our science maintenance account uh, to have our microscopes, microscope serviced and for the removal and disposal of chemicals. Thank you for your time. some comments. Um, I think this is great. It looks like, you know, you've looked at a lot of things and tried to bring it down, actually, and I was thinking that numbers would be higher. Could you just highlight the total percentage increase, Mr. Keller? Say that again, I'm sorry? The, the total percentage increase. The total percentage increase? Yes, for the budget. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't calculate. It's 3.6% before his personnel requests. Okay, and I, the, I didn't calculate it. No, no, that's okay. So you're saying 3.6? It, correct. Yeah. It's, it's on that. And, and yeah. with that, with the personnel increase, is that the one you're saying you're not calculating? I, yeah, I don't have that number. Okay. That, that's okay. I apologize. No, uh, that's great. And, you know, again, I want to say the same things that I'm seeing the, uh, you know, same increases for the support staff um, across the board. And I'm glad you're asking for what you need here. Uh, because one of the things, as I understand, I don't have a child in middle school, and that was not my experience of middle school, but I hear middle school is difficult, and you need all the support <laughs> possible, right? And so um, uh, I think, to me, one of the things is student safety. Again, you know, just like high school, middle school, I understand is difficult, and if um, the support staff is needed, it's needed, and I'm fully behind it. And thank you for bringing this up. Thank you. Anything else? Great. No. no.
Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so one thing that I will say is we're very lucky in this district um, to have principals who really are instructional leaders and who really do take um, a very vested interest in what's happening curricular um, wise in their buildings, which is why we heard a lot of things from Alan that <clears throat> deal with curriculum and you'll hear similar requests from the elementary principals when they come to our next meeting. Um, so in terms of the curriculum budget, curriculum and instruction this year, um, you know, I will say uh, we've added one position, and that is an ELL director position. And um, in my estimation, that's a very important position for us to be adding at this time, uh, considering the dramatic growth in our students who do speak more than one language and who are working to acquire English. And um, we really require the presence of an administrator who is a specialist in this area, who can join our administrative team and really help all of us grow in our skills um, and our strategies in terms of how to support our faculties in the best way possible. Um, in addition, by adding this director position, it will reduce the need for us to have a teacher who's also serving as a coordinator. And this year, due to our numbers, our teacher coordinator has had to shift some of her responsibilities from being a sole coordinator to now a combined coordinator and teacher. And it's becoming more challenging to tap into her expertise when teachers need help and support um, because she's also busy teaching her own students. Um, so for that reason, um, we really, I do think it's the time that we add that position to our administrative team. Um, in terms of where we are with textbook purchases, we are in excellent shape, um, kind of along the lines that Rich talked about. His department was already in really good condition when he inherited it, and I also inherited a, um, a position that had been well taken care of um, in terms of curriculum supports and purchases. So the past several years, there was some heavy lifting and some large purchases for textbooks, and um, we, don't, we just don't require that this year. We have a number of licenses that last for multiple years, and we're in good shape with that. Um, I will also credit our curriculum team leaders because they are awesome at reaching out to our companies and our vendors and our sales reps and kind of getting another year tacked on here and there. Um, so they've done a really fantastic job with that. Um, so because of that, for this coming year, we have a couple of license renewals um, that will be required. Um, we do have a request for a newly proposed course at the high school, a new AP economics class, um, which is being requested due to um, student interest and the fact that we don't have a lot of economics classes at the high school. We have an intro and nothing really following that. Um, but whether or not that class will run, that kind of remains to be seen in terms of what students actually um, sign up for when they um, begin the course selection process um, early this winter. Um, that would not, um, just to be clear, that would not require additional staff. That would require a restructuring of offerings that um, one of the high school business teachers is already um, taking on. So he may add that in and swap that out for something else that perhaps has less interest. Um, the other thing that I'm trying to capitalize on a little bit, even though the, um, you will definitely see that the expense summary has gone down from this account, um, and with kind of that really nice position of not needing a lot of textbooks at the secondary level, um, I did want to take some of the money that has been put into that budget line item and use it for elementary literacy materials. And we've had a lot of work done, um, especially at Hopkins School, really renewing and refreshing the materials and ensuring that we have culturally um, relevant and um, more current texts for our students. Um, I've seen it in action at Hopkins, and Carol, you were there, I think, the day that we were over there, and um, the teachers were so excited about the new books, and the students couldn't wait to open them up. And um, it's all vetted in research, Fountas and Pinnell, that's really the leaders in literacy instruction, especially in this area. And we need to start replicating those materials at the, the lower grade levels, um, Marathon and Elmwood. So we're working really closely, and thanks to the committee and for your support of changing our ELA um, coach to a director this year, we've had incredible traction with the ELA skill set of our teachers. Um, which has also been really economical instead of having to bring in outside consultants to do this kind of training or that kind of training. Um, we have an in-house person here who can not only instruct but then follow up. 
um, and really help us identify the best resources for our students. So um, you will see a significant um, kind of portion of the textbook money um, designed to go to elementary literacy instruction um, for next year. Um, and you've seen the rest of this, so I think it's, it's fairly, um, it's fairly self-explanatory, um, unless you have specific questions. Questions? I, I had a kind of practical question. Are, are more and more of the books, books, and reading materials available online rather than hard copies? Uh, in some of the Fountains and Pinnell materials, one of the great um, added benefits of this is that, yes, okay. the books are available electronically, so students can access them um, in two different ways, and it's also a really great asset for teachers because what happens a lot when you have these materials, they're very costly and they end up getting housed in a kind of a common area. So if you're trying to do your planning at home and you're not, you don't have access to the book room or your, your classroom is at the other end of the building, you can do that planning right from your classroom. So yes. And do we save money because more of those texts are available online than having to purchase so many hard copies or? Susan is smiling with wisdom in her eyes saying nay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably more likely at the secondary level where we yeah. see the online subscriptions. I wouldn't say we're seeing any kind of a savings, I'm sorry to say, at the elementary level. Um, and I think we do really feel strongly at the elementary level, especially that we want books in their hands. Yeah. We have supplemental programs we use for, um, for online programs, but um, thank you. there's a cost. <laughs> I, just, I, I had asked a question and I'll just ask it. I asked it ahead of time but just to share. Um, I had a question about the language testing mm -hmm. um, that it, in the documentation it wasn't mentioned that that is actually according to Ms. Parson part of the seal of biliteracy uh, accreditation. So I had asked about that because it wasn't highlighted but I'm happy that you know I love the seal of biliteracy program. I'm happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah, and that actually, that testing will provide us with some dual roles. It will also provide us with some very consistent assessments um, in our language department in addition to offering students the opportunity for the seal of biliteracy, um, which is really a great addition to their um, credentials when they leave Hopkinton High School. Thank you for mentioning that. My hope actually, you know, just piggybacking a little bit on what Amanda said, is eventually at some point as we're looking at all these expansion uh, and all that we're looking to plan towards the growth, hopefully one day we will have a, a foreign language program starting in earlier grades. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a hope. That's my hope. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you on uh, one on EL. Yes. Um, I have, you know, I've shared with you in the past some of my thoughts around it. And I hope that, you know, sometime um, this year, if you're able to, if you would consider bringing a report back mm -hmm. on EL, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more detailed as mm -hmm. to uh, what is it, you know, what are some of the requirements and what are the benefits as kids, uh, how do they graduate out of mm -hmm. the EL program, if mm -hmm. you will. All right. Uh, we are nearing a million dollars, it looks like, on the budget for EL at this point. So I think it's fair to just share it with the community. Sure. What is it, the, the work that's going on. Uh, the other question related to EL, my hope is that as this director comes on board, we'll possibly look at the formation of EL PAC. My understanding is that that's a requirement. We're right? looking at that this year. Okay, that's, that's fabulous. Caroline just talked about that yesterday. Fabulous. Yes. Um, so those were my yeah. comments on the EL front. The other question um, is more around one of the things that is very dear to me, and again, you know, just per, uh, one person speaking here of the committee. Um, is kids who are getting into classrooms who are already above grade level. Mm -hmm. um, are there things that you're planning to do in the coming year for mm -hmm. them, which is a little different? I know you brought forth a differentiation coach last year. Mm -hmm. um, so is there something else that you're doing for these kids? I would say um, the greatest amount of work that we're doing with our students is really looking at um, embedding and I know we, we use the word differentiation, and I think it means so many different things to different people. Um, but not only are we looking at, so for example, with our ELA director, we're really looking at ensuring that we have right materials for students and that students and that teachers are learning how to move students forward given the skill sets they have and the strengths that they bring to the table. So when you talk about that differentiation and meeting different needs, I would say it feels often like it's more in the wheelhouse of our elementary teachers because they're very used to 
grouping students, looking at levels, um, running little workshop models. And we're doing a couple of things right now at the secondary level that I think are pretty exciting. So one is the guided inquiry training that we just brought in. Um, and that was um, involving about 30 teachers from Hopkins through the high school. And it was an expert that Carol had known in the field and had worked with previously. And her ex expertise really is in supporting students in their um, able to dive deeply into a curricular area and really um, produce some of their own research based on questions that are um, guided by the teacher, but the work is really facilitated very individually by the students. And um, it's a multi-step process, which will take too long to explain right now, but essentially it's the kind of work that can bring students into all kinds of avenues. Um, yes, still within the mass curriculum frameworks, but very much allowing them to take a different kind of path to match their interests and in, in what their needs are. Um, it also involves a lot of collaboration, collaborative work between students, um, but really a lot of deep thinking about why, why am I studying this, what am I looking at, what do I hope to grow from an individual goal setting. Um, the other thing that we're looking at right now and that we're rolling out um, kind of as a pilot program in our middle and high school is this FUSE. Um, a personalized learning model that is sponsored um, in part by tech, our, our ed cooperative um, group that we work with, and um, we've just started that work. So we have teachers who are serving as fellows, and they're really learning a lot more about personalized learning and blended learning, uh, ways to effectively integrate technology into the classroom. And so we have teachers here who are learning to become experts in that area. They're called fellows, and those Hopkinton teachers are going out to other communities, and they're helping to coach teachers. And likewise, we have two trainers who are coming in to our high school and middle school. One is from um, Wayland High School, and one is from Dover Sherborne Middle School. And so those teachers have been trained, and they're coming in, and um, Mr. Keller and Mr. Bishop have identified teachers in those two buildings who are interested in learning um, about this kind of different vision of what a classroom could look like. So I think what we're really hoping to do is provide our teachers with very robust toolkits of ways to address instruction in their classroom. So when we look at students with a whole gamut of strengths and needs, um, how are, what do we have to pull from? No, I, I really appreciate both of those programs. And you know, I'm a big fan of tech in general, yeah. but also the FUSE Fellowship. I, I remember having this conversation with Dr. Kavanaugh maybe a year and a half ago and saying, you know, uh, tech is already putting this money and we mm -hmm. might as well use that. That's right. So I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. glad that all of this good work is happening. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all the good work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, Dr. Kamala, Superintendent's Report. Okay. The so Superintendent's Report has three parts. Um, a budget update, some of the happenings in our school, and then I'm going to report out on the special town meeting articles that are sponsored by the schools. So as I do each time, um, I show our, our net enrollment and sort of just see where our kids are. Um, in terms of numbers, our total enrollment yesterday, I think, was 3,975 students. And you know, I guess maybe to some of the questions that folks asked here tonight about class size, you can see that the average class size in grade one is 23, way too big if you want to uh, keep at the target of 18 to 19. So, you know, and as I was talking to some of our first grade teachers, they'll tell you that they have 22, 23, and 24 in first grade, much too big. So Dr. Kevin, at the previous forum, was it mentioned that next year it's 234 is the projected net? That's what they're so saying. That, that was the Arthur Wagman projection. projection yeah. okay. So, uh, Dr. Cavanaugh, is this the current one, the net? Yes, 165 is our net currently. Um, I, for some reason, I thought it was 270. I thought it was low, yeah, higher. It seems low right. to me. Well, I think it's because we had been looking at the 277 of kids who had been coming in and not counting in the 112 exit. Maybe that could be. Uh, I thought that our projections were 104. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's a right. mathematical error. I yes. Don't know. It seems low. Does it? Mm -hmm. All right, we can look at that. I think that that is correct. 
All right, and then I've just sort of recorded all of the positions that uh, people who have presented their budget to date have asked for. So the ones that you see here are special education technology and facilities. These are all special education requests. Uh, these are some more special education uh, technology and facilities requests. So the last three are the 1.0 FTE webmaster, 0.5 um, administrative support for Mr. Person in facilities, and three custodians. And then these are the ones that were requested tonight, uh, a 1.0 FTE uh, for foreign language in the middle school, half of an assistant principal in the middle school, half of a guidance administrative support uh, secretary in the guidance office, and um, just a couple of very small stipends for middle school, someone to open the gym in the morning and someone to supervise the bus parking lot. And here are the athletics ones, a .5 FTE for administrative support in athletics, middle school assistant football coach stipend. Uh, oop, those two are the ones that uh, Mr. Bishop will be looking for when he is with us next week. He was in this report. And the only one that was being asked for by Mrs. Parson was the 1.0 FTE L director. And just very quickly, some of the happenings in our schools. Uh, these are some of our Thanksgiving things. Uh, the Hillers were able to uh, beat the clockers of Ashland, uh, 26 to 7, on Turkey Day. And Mr. Cormier informed us yesterday that uh, Hopkins' varsity football team is being honored um, by the MIAA. They're receiving a sportsmanship award, and they'll be getting that at Gillette on Friday night. That's wonderful. Nice. Uh, here are some middle school photos. Uh, they had their first Rise Up Day, and Mr. Keller explained that the goal of Rise Up Day is to sort of build a sense of community at the middle school. And that happens because kids are better able to understand themselves and their connections to the world around them. There's a little Thanksgiving feast at Hopkins and the Elmwood meeting of the Eagles over to the right. Here's the Marathon Elementary School Thanksgiving feast celebration. And that was all wrapped up with <coughs> snow again. <so. laughs> Dr. Kavanaugh, if I may um, ask you a question there about the snow again. Yes, um, <laughs> please do. <laughs> such a topic of conversation in the town, especially on social media, about the decision for a snow day. Can you just share what does it involve before you make a call for a snow day? What's the work involved? Who all do you consult? Sure. Well, in an ideal world, you'd be able to call it the night before. You know, if there was you know, a great degree of certainty that 28 inches of snow was going to fall overnight, you know, you'd simply say, fabulous, let's call tomorrow off, and people could go to bed with plans already in place. Uh, but that's not always the case. You know, some storms are a little bit tricky because they'll say it's going to stop snowing at 5 o'clock in the morning and then pick back up again at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Or you're watching a rain snow line. And if it moves 20 miles to the west, it's going to hit Hopkinton. And if it doesn't, it's not going to hit Hopkinton. So, I know it's not ideal, but in those cases, you have to make those calls in the first thing in the morning. So what will happen is um, about 4 o'clock in the morning, Tim Person, Mike Manson from the highway department, and I start having conversations. And yes, we do. And you know, they'll, sometimes they'll send me pictures. Sometimes uh, they'll say, you know, we are down to bare pavement on Hayden Row. And to be honest with you, on Monday, that was the sort of call that I had gotten, that things were looking really good in the community, that they were you know, almost down to bare pavement. And then, of course, you know, the snow started to pick back up. We anticipated the temperatures would be just a little warmer than they were, and they stayed pretty cold. And it really continued to snow throughout the day. I mean, it wasn't that kind of heavy snow, but it was enough to accumulate just a little bit and be a nuisance. And the other thing that I think happened is we had some difficulties with sidewalks on that morning. 
So usually what will happen when we're having our four o'clock in the morning conversations is, you know, sometimes you bring in Chief Slayman because he'll tell you that there are power lines down or trees down or places where the buses can't get through, and the police do that for us as well. But Mike Manser is integral because he'll be able to tell us whether or not he thinks that his guys will be able to get the sidewalks done in some of the um, areas where there's sort of high traffic of walkers. Um, so that happens, and then if we decide to do a two-hour delay or call school off, I reach out to Linda Henderson, who is the person who contacts all of the, the teachers. Um, and then I reach out to Georgette, who gets information on Facebook and Twitter and the local news stations. So all of those people kind of working behind the scenes, and you know, if I let them know that at five minutes of five, usually sometime between five and 5.10, everybody is aware of what the plan is for the day. Uh, for whatever reason, and I had talked to Linda Henderson right around five o'clock on um, Monday morning, uh, for whatever reason, the uh, technology was slow. You know, it didn't get out there till about 5.20. Uh, not that 5.20 is a bad time to get information in the morning. And there is that strange split. So if you're an elementary person, you don't want to hear from somebody at 5 o'clock in the morning. You know, you can call at 7 and they could just roll back over and go to sleep. You know, so a wake-up call at 5 is a little bit much. But if you're a high school person and you travel a great distance to get to work, 5 o'clock is what you need if you're going to give yourself enough time to get to where you're going. So it's a little complicated. The other thing that happens, and I, you know, there are probably 15 or 20 of the superintendents in this area, and we will text back and forth all morning. You know, we'll talk about, you know, what your highway department's telling you, what your police department's telling you, whether or not you're going to open and close. And so it's helpful to know that, especially with the contiguous towns, like if I'm talking to Westboro or Ashland or, you know, Milford, it's nicer that way. And our staff probably lives in many of the surrounding towns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. their own situation to deal with in order to get in. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. That, that helps put it into context that it's not that button. You know, you know, right. uh, yeah, that was easy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I am one of those people who love snow days, mm -hmm. but I imagine that some of the considerations you have to think of are more, you know, um, what would happen to the summer and going uh, further into summer and making up for snow days. I, right. I think those are some of the considerations that, mm -hmm. that are part of this decision. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Sometimes superintendents will say they'll hate us today, but they'll love us in June. Mm -hmm. <laughs> True. I don't see Unless that. they're a senior. Thank you. In which case, oh. bring it on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there were quite a few happy Never seniors. make a day up, so they really <laughs> love it. Uh, just quickly, the uh, high school students went to see the Body Works exhibit at the Museum of Science that was part of the STEAM grant, so they sent some really great pictures back. And for special town meeting on December 9th. So the school department has four articles. Um, they are number two, three, four, and five on the warrant. And the article two is for $500,000 for a design engineering study for those six additional classrooms that we've talked about here at the high school. And those are built out classrooms. Article three is 4,500 to actually construct those uh, built out classrooms. Article four is three million for stacked modular classrooms at Hopkins, and article five is two million for four stacked modulars at Elmwood. And so I thought I would include some frequently asked questions because we've heard these recently as we've been interacting with other town departments. Uh, so sometimes people will say to us, well, what would the schools have done without the special town meeting? Uh, and Mrs. Rodmick, you can chime in as you like. Uh, I think. The portables, if we had addressed them at Maytown meeting, would probably have been just fine because you can put it out to bid, buy your portables, and the construction work for that is relatively quick. So between June and September 1, uh, it would seem that you would be able to get your portable classrooms in, in place. Um, the high school classrooms, that's a, a different story. If we are able to start construction in June of this year, we might be able to have a um, oh, I think it should be a midwinter opening in 2021. Oh, it's no, right. If we didn't have the special town meeting, I'm sorry, let me help myself with my own thinking. We wouldn't have been <laughs> able to open them till 2021, 21, 22. And as it stands now, we will be able to have a midwinter opening in 2021. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, 
Can we live without them for next year or half of next year? We can't live without them for half of next year, or maybe even all of next year, but we'll be doing that crazy thing that we're doing now where we're putting 150 kids in a cafeteria in the morning, um, which is not really good practice, uh, educationally or probably even socially. But for that following year, the 21-22 year, I think we really need those classrooms, so. Uh, will the classrooms be enough, or are we still chasing enrollment numbers? Uh, so if you, we're attentive to the long-term plan that we talked about tonight. Uh, really, there is that, at this point, the thinking is to create some kind of complex that exists between our current middle school and high school. Those two buildings now house seven grades. Eventually, they would probably be at a capacity where they would be able to house five grades. So um, we do need those six classrooms and even when the time comes that you would have five grades across these two buildings, those classrooms would be full. Dr. Kavanaugh, is this the time to speak a little bit about the long-term plan, or uh, would you be looking to bring it back a little bit about uh, what was presented tonight? Uh, yeah, so if people were not tuned in to the early part of the evening, we did take a look at a couple of different configurations. Uh, Marathon would remain intact. It would be a pre-K to one school. Uh, what we saw and what was recommended by the architectural firm is that you know Elmwood would go offline and we would have to think of a way to house our two, three, four, five students, one model, put them into one big school, but that school would be a two different schools in the sense of it would be a school within a school. So one side of it would be two, three, the other side would be four, five, and they would share sort of an internal core. And the opposite one, uh, also on the Todaro property, would have a two, three school and a four, five school. They would be separate entities. Um, and you know, there are, I guess, pros and cons to all of those which were sort of demonstrated tonight. We would have to do a renovation addition project on Hopkins so that it would be able to house grades six and seven. As we are right now, we're looking at it uh, through the lens of four or five, and you know we're adding four modular classrooms for next year. So looking down the road with increased enrollment um, and the removal of those four classrooms, you know, at some point you would have to put an addition on that building. Um, and then eight, nine, as I just said, would sort of be a combination, eight to 12 in, in this Whole area. And uh, may I just say that we <coughs> all to absorb for me personally, I speak yes. for myself. Um, and uh, I was very happy with the number of folks who came and all the questions that, brought, uh, that were brought forth. And, and that was that's a lot to absorb as well. Yes. And I would want us to think about some of the next steps. And uh, I don't know if we want to discuss this a little bit tonight uh, as a committee. We want to bring it back, absorb this a little bit. Uh, what do folks think? <coughs> I, think I, I think I would be inclined to absorb it and to bring it back as a separate, but that's just me. A topic. Yep. Yeah, on yeah, our yeah, agenda. It'd be nice to have time to reflect. Yeah. Mm. So why don't we do that and try and bring it at the next school committee meeting, perhaps? Mm. Sure. And I think a really pivotal piece of all this is going to be whether or not we are invited in by the of MSCA. Of course. Mm -hmm. And do we know when that might be, that invitation? Well, they had shared when we submitted our statement of interest that December would be the magical month. Okay. So it's a long month. It. Okay. It's a long <laughs> month. Yeah, yes. I'm waiting for yes, that magic. Is. You got to figure it's got to come in around the, before the 20th, right? Because after that, it's not going to come in. Right. So soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. It narrows it down. Yeah, it narrows it down a little bit. Within the next 10, 15 days, we probably will know, right? Uh, and then another frequently asked question, do you really need those modular classrooms? And I can tell you 100% for sure, we absolutely do. I mean, we can't have 14 and 14, uh, fifth, fourth and fifth grade classes at Hopkins without them. You know, there really just is not the physical room for that. I mean, you might be able to you know, close an art room, but you know, at the end of the day, you're not getting four classrooms out of that building. Can I ask a question about um, timing of staffing those classrooms? Mm -hmm. Because there, so we need to go from 12 to 14 in grades four and five, so presumably we'll need classroom teachers. Right? And you'll see that so in Mrs. Bellello's budget. I'm assuming, right? Yeah. So if this were to wait until May, if this is going to your previous slide, 
that puts us in a pretty tight turnaround to then staff new teachers, four new teachers, not just one. Mm -hmm. You know, is that, I don't know what the typical um, search process looks like, but it seems like a tight turnaround. Well, I think that's another advantage of the special town yeah. meeting. So, you know, if you get underway with this project and you know that you're going to be able to open those doors and you start the process in March, you can be out there recruiting the very best teachers you can in March as opposed to, you know, after town meeting in May, we start looking in June. Yeah. Right. It does make a huge difference. It seems like it, yeah. yeah. yeah it's better than no. candidates. All right, and people will say, are you leasing or are you buying those modulars and do they have a resale value? Um, so Mrs. Rothermick has done all the research on this and what it has um, shown us is that if you're going to have these modular classrooms for like four to five years, you are probably fiscally better off to own them. Um, and can they be resold? They can be, but it's going to be dependent on whatever the market bears out at the time of the sale. Um, and then the, the other thing is, after five years, you know, say for example, we've got a new two to five school, or six years, we've got a new two to five school, you may not want to sell them because they may be needed in other locations throughout the district while, you know, you're working on other construction projects. And that's all. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kavner. Something on, on the administrative website. Mm -hmm. Did you have some comments? No, I only asked uh, Mrs. Rodnick if she wanted to add anything to that because she is the modular expert. <laughs> <among us. laughs> expert. That's good to know. I'm just reciting her lines tonight. Okay. <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, the next item on the agenda, the chair report. Uh, I can't believe we have actually caught her. It's 8.30, right on time. Um, so I approve the payroll warrants S2011A, S2011, and S2011B. Payroll warrants have been included in your packet. I've also approved warrants number 20-024, number 20-025, and number 20-026. Warrants have been included in your packet. Um, some other updates that I have. Um, I had an opportunity to both join Dr. Kavner at the CIC, the Capital Improvements Committee meeting. I thought it was a great presentation um, on um, the administrative team's part. Dr. Kavner, uh, Ms. Rothenberg, and Jim Person did a great job. I also think CIC had uh, some fabulous questions. They asked us uh, about the long term, how do these, uh, uh, you know, this immediate term, how does it fit into the long term? Uh, I think they were prepping us for the special town meeting. Yeah, so I, I appreciated all the feedback that we received from them. Uh, besides that, uh, I had an opportunity to provide some feedback to Dr. Kavanaugh for the warrant articles. Actually, I had an opportunity to work with Nancy. Um, and uh, you know, we worked with Dr. Kavanaugh a little bit looking at the verbiage and uh, you know, some of the experience Nancy had from the main uh, town meeting that was helpful to kind of say, especially around the second war uh, warrant, um, the first warrant article, but the second motion within the article, which is about $200,000, which are already in our stabilization fund and under the purview of the school committee, our question was, is it needed to be on the special town meeting? So there was some good back and forth, but I, I thought that the final outcome is something that works for us all. So that was great. Um, besides that, I had an opportunity to attend the top of the hill, and I came out so impressed, and uh, I just had, I loved the, uh, the folks who were honored and uh, awarded uh, uh, the top of the hill award. And they were all coming from very different backgrounds and different journeys in their life. One of the things that actually two of the recipients talked about is how much athletics played a role in their life. And uh, so that, that was very uh, good for me to hear. Uh, and uh, a person uh, who came was on a wheelchair, and he has uh, done a PhD, and he talked about his struggles pre-ADA mm -hmm. and how he overcame um, you know, some of the notions that people had. And he said he was an athlete before he 
uh, became wheelchair uh, on the on the wheelchair, and he said actually that helped him, and a lot of uh, his teammates supported him through his journey. And I'm going a little long, but I, I was super impressed with that. Um, the other thing I had an opportunity um, to do was to go to the EHOP event, which I had mentioned to all of you, which was with the Chinese American Association of Hockey. And it was a great turnout. There were over 30 people who had turned up, and they had great questions. And um, I had an opportunity to speak about what what is it that the school committee does, what's under our purview, uh, what is the work of uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, and how do we all work together. And, how they can reach out to us, how they can access information. So it was a great event, I thought. Um, and I know um, the next item, sorry. Um, yes, so I also had an opportunity to uh, uh, speak to a community member who followed up with a note about you know, some of the expansion plans that we are having. Um, and her concern was that we should not move to districting. Not that we have it here, but her concern was especially with the way the demographics are set up at the legacy farms, that might result in some form of segregation, and um, so I appreciated that feedback. And Dr. Cabra, you also received that mm -hmm. as well. And it's just received, I'll, I'll be happy to share uh, in a general with you. And that's all I have for updates, so on to liaison reports. I can speak. Well, okay, well, okay. I'm not sure this is a liaison, but I'm going to speak about it anyway. So <laughs> I, I had an opportunity to attend um, with Dr. Kavanaugh and Ms. Parsons the superintendent evaluation forum that was put on by the MASC and MASS. Um, and it was really interesting. It was really good. Um, I, I guess there's a lot to talk about there, but I guess I'd like to request that we put that on the agenda for a future meeting. Um, some of the key points that came across to me, and I had also attended a similar session at the MASC conference last year. So as a newbie, I heard some messages, kind of put them on the, in the filing cabinet, and then I heard them again. So now I'm talking about them because they've come up twice. And it was um, the common practice and recommended practice of school committees to narrow down the list of attributes um, Attributes is the wrong term. What are they called? Uh, indicators, yeah. elements. Yeah. Elements, <laughs> elements, I think, yeah, that we um, actually evaluate the superintendent on and agree to a mm -hmm. subset. And that's sort of a, a common theme. So I'd like to just throw that forward to um, those who set the agenda and ask if we could maybe have an opportunity to talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, and the other, it truly is on feedback. Um, the website subcommittee did uh, put out a survey, and we've so far had um, okay response. I think there are between 100 and 200 responses so far, and we are in the process of compiling, uh, we being me, I am in the process of <laughs> comp compiling those results, and the subcommittee will be meeting to go over those, and I'll be back to share after. Great. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. I have one uh, growth study committee met earlier this week and um, kind of debriefed on the public hearing that was held uh, before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Right, I think it was a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago. It is totally blending together. But it was good and um, we, we were able to talk about how the, what was discussed at each table and sort of combine um, thoughts and try to look for some big picture items, which was good. Um, and I think um, one of the things that it, that we struggle with, that they're trying, struggling with the fact that we don't have this information, is, you know, it's kind of like the sort of crystal ball thing that everybody's looking for, you know? And it, when you say those words, everybody's like, no, it's not a crystal ball, there's gotta be data, but the question is, you know, people who move into town with one child, and then they have this one-year-old when they move in, and then they have two more children, and we don't even know that they are, they have three because we use birth rate data that own that you know those two children and so it's just this mix of how to figure out what's coming um, into the schools what's going to start off in pre-k and you know trying to find a way to determine that data um, which is what they're struggling with and so you know they they asked me to reach out and, and see if anyone had any thoughts and ways that that might happen 
<laughs> there was even a suggestion like when they do the fire inspection, maybe you can look around and see if there's any kids walking around. In the but I'm like, that's that's creepy and not okay. We gotta like, back it up and you know, they're jokingly, you know, joking, joking. But still, it was one of those things where like, there, how do you get this information? Where where do you get information? Because no one has to re report how many children they have under the age of three when they move into a town. Mm -hmm. They don't have to. Right. Um, and so anyway, that was the big topic of conversation from that. And the, the group is going to continue to meet. Um, uh, May is kind of the deadline for that particular committee, but they're definitely going to look more deeply at fire, police, DPW, um, water and sewer, you know, effects of increased numbers of roads to plow and maintain and things like that. So anyway, lots of, lots of stuff on the growth study committee. And then the one other thing is um, just to keep everybody in the loop, the policy committee, we know we haven't had policy on the um, agenda for a couple of weeks now, a couple of meetings now, but we are going to meet briefly tomorrow and then go through some of the policies that have already been brought forth once just to kind of fine tune them so we can bring them back um, because I know we, it, we, we have to work around schedules and things like that. It's tricky. So we're just going to look at what we've already brought forward, tweak those, bring them back to you, and we won't start on new stuff maybe till after the new year. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, actually, thank you so much for um, serving on the town growth study committee. It's, it's very interesting. And, and it's a lot of work and not to absorb, and it's so important. I'm so glad you're on. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Good attendance at that forum, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were very, it was impressive how many people showed up for that. And everyone had, it was interesting how each table had similar conversations. Same sort of things came mm -hmm. up at each table. And there are a few, you know, little things that came up at tables that were unique, but for the most part, the community seems interested in the same kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and a sizable representation from the school committee. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very sizable. <laughs> Though we were not sitting together and not deliberating. Right? <laughs> sure. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I, I actually want to, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk, uh, catch up with both of you, uh, Dr. Kavner and Jen, about the policy committee. You know, what I realized is uh, as I've started to t have taken on this new role as chair this year, some of these things I wasn't anticipating. You know, you think you're only attending a lot of meetings, but there's a lot of networking that I've gotten involved in. You know, I've, I've worked really hard to uh, ask people come up uh, to the public hearing. I'm sure everyone did too. And so I'm finding myself in a place where I feel that I've, I have a lot on my plate and perhaps some folks are a little underused. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Amanda, you had worked on the policy subcommittee in the past and I know you, uh, you've said you miss it. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you or actually anyone, and Nancy or Meg, would like to take on that role um, on my behalf because of the scheduling issues. I don't want to be in that Talking. position mm -hmm. where it's only two people. I really think policy subcommittee is so important. I'd actually like to see it become a subcommittee where it's actually posted and open to public. But I don't want to add that work on yet. It's for you guys to decide really. Uh, but open, open to anybody. Yeah, well, you can think about it. Don't feel it, like this is only, you know, Schedules are tricky, so don't feel like you need to make any calls right now. We can figure it out as moving forward. I mean, That's we would love to have you, but if you can't, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. maybe we'll wait for one more review yeah, yeah, yeah. and come back to this. Okay. And, and maybe folks can think about it in the meantime. I know, Nancy, you had served on the policy yeah. subcommittee at some point. I do like Before the work, me. but, you know, I don't want, I, I want us to be fully, fully utilized. No. I would be very happy to step in. Oh, great! If you if you figure that your schedule does not allow for it, but um, you can give it another cycle. I mean, whatever. I, I enjoy the work. That's so. great. Um, you know, actually, if you just want to step in for tomorrow, <laughs> that, that won't hurt. It's at eleven thirty tomorrow. Just yep. just saying it, and we can figure this out um, as we go along. Thank you. Anything else on the liaison reports? Nancy, you did a lot of work with the War Range articles and all the planning too. Oh, you were there with me. Okay, okay we'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, new business, transportation staff. Ms. Rothman. Thank you. Um, our current transportation coordinator will be retiring. Um, and as you can imagine, this is an extremely significant position. Um, so what I'm looking to do is hire somebody but allow for part-time overlap for the remainder of the year. Um, starting March 1st, we actually start designing bus routes. So the timing and um, everything around learning this position, learning the software and everything around it 
having an overlap would be extremely valuable. Any questions? No question. I think it's, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's a complicated. complicated. Yeah, it's a hard job. <laughs> to have someone so go in. Want to be on that custom committee? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, oh, again, it goes back to all the growth that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, and transportation is always something we hear about. Right. And it's more, so, yeah. more so in recent times. And we want our kids to arrive, you know, ready to learn. We talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, the transportation just, it's critical. So sure. thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Uh, thank you. A motion by Jen, a second by Nancy. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. And uh, as well. And so it passes. Thank you, Ms. Rockman. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, Legacy Farms Monies. Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so we had discussed this when we were thinking about the articles and the motions for special town meeting. Um, what I think needs to happen is that we have to have uh, the school committee's approval of the expenditure for up to $500,000 of legacy farms mitigation money for the purpose of engineering design study for those six additional classrooms. Uh, we had a conversation when we went before the Board of Selectmen about whether or not we needed the 200,000 to also be brought forth at town meeting. And it was the opinion of the town's council that um, we should keep both of them on there because the way that it's worded, it says that uh, the money is used to be in whole or in part for uh, mitigation of the impact of additional students. And um, their contention was that uh, even though this is legacy farms money, it would be nice to have that 200000 sort of re-voted on because the engineering design study feels to them that it's almost one step away. The actual classrooms would be to mitigate the growth, but the design study might be one step. So um, in conversation with the Board of Selectmen, we sort of decided that it's not going to hurt anything to do it this way. So yeah, better to be safe than sorry was our attitude. Um, and then you know that when we go to the special town meeting, they are going to ask if the school committee is in support of that article. But just to be clear to the community, the 200000 has already been appropriated. It so was. So it's, it's the 300000 that is an additional. Yes. Yeah. But we're going to ask town meeting to do all five. Yep. Kind of all over again. Yeah, sure. Half all over again. Do you need a vote from us at all on that? Uh, Tonight. Yes, right? Yes. Yeah, there's a motion in here, yeah. yeah. Right, and, and just to be clear, um, so this particular, the Legacy Farms money, this particular article um, is uh, all coming from the host community agreement. So the source of it, and I think that's why you split it, right, Dr. Kavner, because the other one is more, um, you know, it affects the prompt two and a half, which will trigger uh, the ballot questions as well. Exactly. So the, the next ones that are on the agenda, what we're really doing is just asking that you recommend Articles 3, 4, and 5 on the special town meeting warrant so that when at town meeting they say, does the school committee recommend this, you will say yes. Right. And, and just to, again, clarification here, what we are approving here are the articles, the motions are separate from the article. And there are actually two motions under the first, this art, the article related to legacy bonds funds. So just want to clarify that. So the article itself will stand, but the motion may be altered on the floor if there is, you know, based on the discussion that comes up. Right, fair enough, that's right. normal. Mm -hmm. Just a comment for, again, for just consideration in general. In my personal opinion, the legacy farms money is um, very appropriately, appropriately used to build capacity. Like, mm -hmm. it, this is not something where we're like adding headcount and it's in the budget every year. This is specifically, I think, for what this money is supposed to be used right. for. Right. So, you know, as one, it makes sense. one person, I think this makes yeah. you know, a lot of sense. Perfect. Yes, and I think that there are, um, so the way the host community agreement was written, when you hit the 250 students, you'd get 500,000. But the clock would start ticking again when you hit 266, and it would um, calculate in increments of 30. So each one of those 30 uh, would get you to like another $400,000. So there should be additional legacy farms money coming to the schools. 
And we know Sorry, we're a little distracted. <laughs> I know. <here. laughs> I had a sad dog and a big problem. Oh. Good night, Mrs. Carver. Oh, no. That's all right. I know. I thought she was bringing him up here. Yeah. And that, I think you made yes. an excellent point um, that there. this is something should be no great. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Um, so looking for a motion to approve the expenditure of up to uh, $500,000 of the legacy farms mitigation monies for the purpose of engineering design study for six additional classrooms at Hopkinton High School and recommend Article 2 as long outline on the special town meeting. So moved. Motion by Jen. Second. Second, Second by Nancy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 As well, and so it carries. Um, Dr. Cameron, the item C on new business, special town meeting articles. Yes, and this one's really simple. Uh, just looking for the committee to recommend articles 3, 4, and 5 uh, on the special town meeting warrant. Um, and those are the construction of six additional High school classrooms, modular classrooms at Hopkins, modular classrooms at Elmwood. Any questions? Okay, looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion by Jen, second by Nancy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. As well, and, and so it carries. Thank you so much, Dr. Kevin. I know this was a lot of work. Um, just the verbiage, a little and, and an I, and a may, and a should. Yeah. Right. A <laughs> lot, lot of good work here. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, we worked hard on that. Old business, solar battery storage for Marathon School. Ms. Rothenick. Thank you. Um, so I know at the last meeting, um, or afterwards, there were several articles that were passed around um, to the committee. So uh, Chief Slayman has just returned from vacation, so tonight's meeting was not something he could commit to. Um, so I'm just recommending if you still would like to hear from him that we postpone till another meeting when he could attend. Do the members feel that's okay? That's not going to negatively impact the installation of the batteries if we decide to go with it, will it? Um, I mean, there are financials attached, you know, to the installation, so it's like time sensitive it is, financials? It is, it is all part of it. I mean, okay. the proposal, it is all part of it. Okay. Because we meet, we meet Thursday, don't we? We In meet one next week? Thursday. We meet next yeah. week. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so that's great. So we'll hold off either next Thursday or whenever okay. uh, Mrs. Slayman is, Chief Slayman is able to make Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, public comments. <laughs> Whatever happened. <laughs> okay. So uh, since we don't have anyone here public, um, does anyone else want to make a public comment? <laughs> She's like, no, really? All right, moving on. <laughs> Items by consensus. Okay. Dr. Kavna. As superintendent, I recommend that the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined on the agenda. So moved. Second. Unless there's discussion, sorry. No. Is there? Okay. Uh, motion by Jen, a second by Nancy. All those in favor? Yes, Aye. yes. And yes as well, and so it carries. Uh, before the adjournment, uh, I just would like to remind anyone who's watching to please come to the special town meeting and uh, look at all the items, articles that are out there, and uh, we hope uh, you ask all the questions on your mind and vote. And to be fair, it's going to be not a three-hour affair in all likelihood. There's only six oh, articles. Yes. Right. Right. I know I should, but yeah. it's a, there's only <laughs> six <laughs> articles. We can do 20 in a night. <laughs> right. There's only six. Just come for those six. That, that's great. And with that said, I cannot believe we are adjourning at 8.52 p.m. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. uh, so Motion to adjourn. Thank you. You bet. Uh, second. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Motion by, no, not at all. Motion by uh, Jed, second by Nancy. All those in favor? Yes. yes. I'm a yes as well. And so we are adjourned at 8.52 p.m. Most Our next excellent. meeting is on December 9, 2019. We're doing it all. Uh, the conference room and middle school auditorium at 6.30 p.m. It will not be telecast by each camp between 6.30 and 7 p.m. And at 7 p.m. we will be moving on to the special town meeting. And then we also have a meeting next week. And after that, we have a good break. And we'll be back <laughs> on January 2nd. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bob.